The number of migrant crossings this year has surpassed 40,000. Good morning to you. It's six o'clock, Monday, the 14th of November already. I know, it's can't, I can't quite believe it. It's, it's Christmas scary, before it's you know It's scaring me a little bit. This is Breakfast on GB News with Isabel and Stephen. Here's what's leading the news this morning. The number of migrants making the journey across the Channel from France this year has reached 40,000, according to the Ministry of Defence, with just under 1,000 making the journey on Saturday. We'll speak to the Foreign Secretary later in the programme. The Chancellor has warned that everyone will have to pay more tax under his new economic plans due to be published on Thursday. He's reportedly looking to raise £20 billion in taxes. He feels betrayed by the club. Cristiano Ronaldo speaks out about his experience at Manchester United as he claims manager Eric Ten Hag is trying to force him out. And King Charles turns 74 today. It's going to be marked by the rendition of Happy Birthday by the Household Cavalry and gun salutes across London. And as always, we love to hear from you throughout the programme, so do please get in touch with us. Use our Twitter handle or you can send an email. Well, our main news this morning then, and the number of migrants crossing the English Channel this year has now surpassed 40,000. It's the highest number ever recorded. Well, the figures released by the Ministry of Defence show a marked increase on last year when just over 28,000 crossings were documented. Well, it follows protests in London by thousands of Albanians in opposition to the Home Secretary's rhetoric on immigration. Well, let's speak to immigration lawyer Skylar McKeith. A very good morning to you, Skylar. I mean, just hearing those figures and the confirmed figures uh, out over the last few days really gives you a sense of how this problem is getting out of control now. Um, do you get a sense that there is some sort of system in place to get a grip of this now? Yeah, so this is a huge problem. And so the reason for these delays is that fewer decisions are being made on asylum applications, while the number of claims have actually increased. And this was a result of the 2020 pandemic, which led uh, to certain home office changes, which basically slowed down the whole decision making process. And so what happened was asylum interviews were suspended during the first lockdown, and then they recommenced via video conferencing. And so this led to a reduction in the number of decisions being made, resulting in a backlog. And we have actually seen a backlog in the application processing across most of the immigration categories. But the the other immigration categories, such as work-related visas, are not experiencing delays in the same way as the asylum claims are. And um, the number of caseworkers at the Home Office has actually increased over the last decade, but the average number of interviews and decisions carried out each month has decreased. Is it, is it and, partly because of this delay and the fact that people, once they get here, are certainly staying here for a considerable amount of time before any decisions are made, that is encouraging more people to try to get across? Yeah, well, the, the problem as well is that these asylum seekers not, are not allowed to work while their applications are in process. And so they instead rely on the government funds for the duration of their claim. And so the increasing numbers of the asylum seekers waiting for decisions is resulting in additional costs to the taxpayer. But at the same time, the conditions at there's an immigration processing centre in Kent called Manston, and the conditions at Manston, it has been reported that these conditions are dire, and they are, they are there are days when they run out of food and drinking water, and there are also inadequate cleaning regimes. So it's not all perfect, um, but they are they are still relying on taxpayer funds while they are here as they are not allowed to work. And at the same time, though, the backlog affects the lives of these individuals, such as family life, mental health and well-being, while awaiting a decision. But it does cost the taxpayer a lot of money. It, it's estimated to be at least almost £9,000 per person um, each for each year of the delay. I mean, obviously, the huge problem is, you know, most normal, right-thinking people can see that if people are fleeing war and tragedy, then, of course, as one of the richest nations on the planet, we want to be able to help these people. We did it wonderfully with Ukraine. We've got a history of doing it. But when you see people coming into the country and being put up, in some cases, in stately homes, costing £200 a night at a cost of £5.6 million per day to the taxpayer... This hotel situation is just untenable and it really actually turns the public opinion and the public mood uh, against uh, this whole system. 
Yeah, absolutely. And so there are certain countries that people may be coming from are deemed safe countries by the UK government. And so according to certain figures, the nationality with the highest number of small boat arrivals is Albanian. And the UK government has stated that small boat crossings are dangerous and unnecessary for Albanians, as Albania is considered a safe country. And the Refugee Council has also said that it is critically important that ministers take urgent action to reduce the pressure on the asylum system. And um, so, yeah, some, something absolutely needs to be done. And it remains to be seen as to whether the Home Secretary's potential plan with Macron works in practice. But something definitely does need to be done to change the way the current system is. And um, currently, asylum seekers may be sent to a safe country that will consider their asylum claim, but this might happen if they've traveled to the UK through a safe third country or have a connection with another country that they could claim asylum in. If someone, I mean, to use Albanians as an example, because you, you raised that as a safe country, um, if Albanians are coming in, are crossing the channel, why can't they be almost immediately deported? It, it remains to be seen as to, as to what the UK government is going to do, but the Home Office simply does not have the resources to deal with, with the influx. And this could also, it, it's an ongoing burden on the UK taxpayer. And so this issue is part of a, large, a larger problem. And the government needs to have further discussions with the EU potentially as to the approach needing to be taken. OK, Skylar McKee, thank you very much indeed. Immigration lawyer uh, talking to us this morning. Thank you. I mean, it does. It's it's so difficult, isn't it? And it, you you do end up sounding heartless, in a way. And so I was thinking that as I say, well, why not just immediately deport them? You end up sounding heartless, but this cannot continue at this rate. I mean, it just cannot. Well, I think the point I was trying to make was that it, you know, having people coming in in vast numbers from safe countries takes away from those people who have genuine okay. claims uh, claims of for asylum. Mm. And I think that's where I think the whole problem becomes really messy, and people's sympathy runs out very, very, very quickly. quickly. Mm. I say, especially especially with that six million pounds a day <laughs> being spent when we haven't got any money. Mm. Really? Yeah, well, speaking of money... Oh, yes, go uh, on. Well, our next story is all about uh, the much-anticipated announcement on Thursday from the Chancellor. He's been warning that everyone will have to pay more tax as he prepares to unveil that autumn statement on Thursday. Now, he's reportedly preparing a package that would see £20 billion of tax rises and £35 billion worth of spending cuts. Yesterday, he said that although the tax rises would disappoint people he would still protect the most vulnerable. Well, joining us now for more is Leon Emirali, a former aide to the Chief Secretary to the Treasury. Really good morning to you. It's always very difficult when chancellors come out and start to lay the ground and prepare us for an autumn statement in a way that we didn't see with the mini-budget recently because they sort of tease about what's going to be included, but they won't give the details. So we're in that very strange uh, pe period in the run-up to, to Thursday's announcement. That being said, his language is really, really important. He's been very careful with his language. And I know he stopped saying those with the broader shoulders are going to bear the brunt of this. He started saying we're all going to be paying more taxes. Is there anything to be read into that? Because I suspect that's a reference to the fact he's still protecting a lot of those very wealthy pensioners. Yes, well, pensioners are going to be one of the big political hot potatoes here. What do you do with them? We spend a lot of money on pensions, but also politically, you know, they are a key constituency <laughs> for whichever party wants to be in power. So there's a big question mark over what happens to pensioners. But we see this all the time, as you say, before a fiscal event. You've got policies sort of being trialled, so you leak the odd bit here and there and, and see what the public reaction is like. And then there's some expectation management. So Jeremy Hunt going around this weekend telling everyone it's going to be awful, we're all going to have to pay, it doesn't matter how wealthy you are or, or, or not, everyone has to shoulder some of this responsibility. So it might be a case of damaging you know, expectation management so that when mm. Thursday does come around, it's not as bad as we anticipate. I mean, it's interesting with the tax rise issue because what, what's been touted around a lot is it's not actually raising taxes, it's freezing the movement mm -hmm. of thresholds, which... I mean, in effect, it does the same thing, but it does it in a slightly less painful way, doesn't it? It does, but it's the same argument, isn't it? It's less money in our pockets, so whatever form that comes, I think we're all about to get slightly less 
better off. Mm. Um, and I think that, you know, whether it's raising thresholds or introducing new taxes or finding other ways, but ultimately the state is going to be taking a bit more of our money mm. and cutting a bit more of the public services that we all use. So it's not a pretty picture. Mm. Mm. But the Bank of England telling us that we're going into recession, the Chancellor yesterday saying that if that is the case, they want to make it as short and shallow as possible. Do you think he's on course to be doing that or is there a risk he could be making things worse? Well, there is a risk he could be making things worse. I mean, we are in a period where we're not talking about growth anymore. We're just talking about stabilising the ship, mm -hmm. essentially, of balancing the books. And yes, that needs to be done, but we need to have, and sorry to use the term of George Osborne and David Cameron, a long-term economic plan that tells us there's light at the end of the tunnel. So we all have to put up mm. with some of this, uh, you know, nastiness and these tax cuts and these, uh, sorry, these tax raises and these spending cuts. But is there a vision at the end of this? Well, I wonder with all of this, we're all looking towards the autumn statement. Mm. I wonder if actually what he's thinking about is the spring statement. Well, it could well be. I mean, they're already talking about you know, the, the energy support that we're getting ending um, for, for, them, for everyone in April, um, and just those who, who need it most will continue with it. So there is a slight nod to longer-term impact of this. And, you know, the autumn statement is just there to stabilise the to stabilise the books after what happened with Liz Truss's disastrous mini-budget. This is a chance to say, we're serious, we're grown-ups, we know what we're doing, trust us and then longer down the line we can try and have some sort of plan for growing the economy. Because all of this, I mean, I know obviously growth is very important. I mean, obviously it's very important. But what this is doing is, is this is going to make us spend less, mm -hmm. which, which affects growth, but also should reduce inflation, shouldn't it? Which is the, the enemy number one. It is, and the nice thing here, the reassuring thing, is that we've got a government and the Bank of England working in tandem to reduce inflation. And I think part of the problem with Truss's mini-budget was that the Bank of England were doing one thing, raising interest rates, government doing another thing, cutting taxes. Yeah. Whereas now we've got government, we've got Bank of England working in tandem, that should be some level of reassurance. And I suppose also the fact that the OBR were excluded last time but are included this time will be absolutely key because none of us actually knows the true state of the economy. We're just taking it at the word of, of, of the Chancellor at the moment. Indeed. And we're talking about this 55 billion, 60 billion black yeah, a floating hole. Floating number. How floating big numbers. is this black hole? Yeah, indeed. <laughs> so we, you know, we, we're going to find out the true extent of this and, and that will help the Chancellor sell that to the country because this is a tough job to get the country on board. It is going to be painful if mm. we are, you know, we're looking at everything on face value. So to have the OBR numbers there is going to be a massive help and we can see the, the damage for ourselves. Yeah, it's all about, it's all about short-term pain for long-term gain. Seems to be, seems to be. And I do think that there is going to be that, that idea of having to sell a longer vision because Rishi Sunak's come in as this sort of saviour, but only just for being a sensible guy who knows what he's doing. There needs to be more than that if he wants to win the next general election. He needs to offer a vision people can get excited about and can get behind. I suppose that politically, though, there's some tricks that they can use with all of that, whether a lot of the announcements will be front-loaded, as they call it, or back-loaded, so that perhaps, say... Under a Labour government, some of that pain would have to be experienced. You can sort of say, we're going to have to make these cuts, but we'll do it, you know, in two years' time. Always, always a, a, good, a good tool in the armoury, isn't it? Is, is let the opposition potentially have the, carry the can for it. Yeah. But, you know, ultimately, this is a signal to the markets that we are back on track, yeah. that we have got a plan to reduce inflation, to make Britain a good place to do business again. So that's what this is about. And getting confidence in the markets back and then being able to look at what happens further down the line. Can I ask you about um, GDP? And obviously that, that dropped uh, in the last... It was July to September and it dropped 0.2%, which is less than people are expecting. But the September figure itself was 0.5%. Now, in terms of trend, what would you expect to see going forward up until whenever the next quarter ends? Well, I think we are going to see a level of stagnation in terms of GDP. I mean, it, it's a combination of factors here, which is obviously coming out of the pandemic, so productivity is potentially lower than it was previously. There is the B word of Brexit. There is a debate to be had as to whether that is, you know, creating opportunities or creating risks. And then there's just the idea of general stagnation in the economy that we've seen for quite a while. So I do think GDP is not necessarily going to grow um, beyond where we think it's going to be. The idea of a recession coming in, you know, it's not official yet, but it's all, all but. Mm. Uh, so I think that that is going to, again, hamper GDP. But we need to find a vision for the country for them to be able to set out a growth plan, effectively, mm. alongside tax rises and spending cuts. Okay. okay. Lee, I'm really good to talk to you this morning. Thank you very much Thank indeed. You. Thank you.
well with the time at 6.14. Let's bring you up to date on the latest headlines this hour. The International Trade Secretary will travel to Washington today to seek for UK-US cooperation on global economy and trade rules. Kemi Badnock will call for a move towards more diverse and resilient supply chains, as well as investing in new technology to support jobs. Uh, the union, Unite, has warned the Prime Minister the autumn statement is his last chance to save the NHS. They say the health service is on the brink of collapse, asking Rishi Sunak to act to avert industrial action and fix underfunding across the NHS. The King is celebrating his 74th birthday today, his first as the monarch. The King's expected to mark the anniversary privately, but there will be gun salutes across London to honour the occasion. Now, you want to delve into what I think, frankly, yeah. is dangerous territory. Oh, do you? I think you're going to have to be very careful with oh, this one. Oh, OK. Well, just a story on the front of the mirror that we all spotted when we were looking through the papers first thing. And we think, and I say, I say Isabel some thinks. of the team, yeah, not Stephen, that the mirror have made Kate look very different from all of well, the she, other papers. She does. Um, and her face looks as though they've done something to her on a filter. So um, we can put it up against some of the other papers and the other coverage of where you can see her. And I have to say, I mean, I've never seen her look like that before. That was how she looked in on camera. Uh, as a still shot there, but I mean, what yes, do you I mean think? that just looks like Kate. Yeah. Well, actually, we should say Catherine. Catherine. Actually, yeah, Princess she of Wales. She introduces herself to others as Catherine, so we should say Catherine. Um, but no, the picture on the front of the mirror does make her look um, very dark. Oh, there you go. Um, it looks. Uh, it looks look like they've downloaded one of those apps and apps. they've aged her by fifteen to twenty years. It does. But do you know what I thought? But well, isn't she a handsome older woman? <laughs> yeah, but no one wants to see themselves on the front of a paper 20 years older than they really are. She's so beautiful. Um, yeah, so she's what do you beautiful. think? Do you think that they have um, been messing with her face or is it just an unfortunate angle? Does it it's, not matter? It's probably just the angle and the light. But they've used it for a reason. They've done do that you think for so? a reason. Well, ev to be fair, everyone who's walked in and seen that has said, what? what's going on yeah, with that? There you go. So, so they must think? have known what go. they were doing. I don't know why they do it. But the plus side is, <laughs> Catherine is, is a... What would you be there? Mid... She's 40. Late... She's just 40, yeah. All right, so it's oh, si a 60-year-old lady. You look stunning. <laughs> You're going to age well, hopefully. You're going to age very well. You're going to be a very <laughs> handsome They better be woman. careful. They can't do that with the king. Add an extra 20 years on. Well, they could. They could, but... Yeah. Well, we're a bit more drastic. Anyway, let us know what you think um, about the picture on the front of the mirror or any of the other topics that we're talking about this morning. Now, one year ago today, Ahmad al Swayalmin blew up a taxi outside Liverpool's Women's Hospital. Now, although the bomber was the only person to be killed in the blast, it shocked the country and was considered an act of terrorism. Our northwest of England reporter Sophie Reaper has this report. An act of terrorism that rocked the nation. One year ago today, as people around the UK gathered to mark Remembrance Sunday, one man had other ideas. On the morning of November 14th, 2021, Imad El Swailmeen booked a taxi to take him from Rutland Avenue to Liverpool Women's Hospital. As the vehicle arrived at the destination, he detonated a homemade explosive device which engulfed the taxi in flames. Driver David Perry miraculously escaped. Swailmeen did not. One man who saw it all unfold was Darren Knowles, who was working as a hospital security guard at the time. I was just at the side of my car on my brake, pumping my tyre up because it had a bit of a flat tyre. Next minute, I seen a taxi rush in, and I looked over thinking, why was it speeding? Because you don't really see that at a hospital. And then next minute, I just heard a slight bang and saw grey smoke and black smoke, so like coming from the front of the car, so we ran over. Saw the taxi driver get out, grabbed him, uh, tried to go back for his takings, his mobile phone and everything. And uh, I just held him back, saying, no, it'll probably go up again. And he told me basically what had happened and there was a terrorist inside the car. How do you think the people of Liverpool were impacted by this act of terrorism? All of us just couldn't believe what happened, especially with it being a children's hospital where babies are born and young families and everything. We just horrific, traumatised. It's a memory that I'm never, ever going to lose. It's just something I've got to learn to cope with.
A year on, although the day-to-day -day may have returned to normal, there is a sense that things will never be the same at Liverpool Women's. In a statement, the hospital's chief executive said, whilst we can be grateful that the absolute worst did not happen, there is no escaping the fact that there was intent to cause significant harm. The scars on our buildings have diminished, but some of the deeper scars of that terrible intent remain. Now, although a full year has elapsed, the people of Liverpool will never forget this act of terror against their proud city. Sophie Reaper, GB News. Oh, again, where does the time go? Yeah. But that, I mean, thank heavens, the only person who hurt themselves or killed themselves mm -hmm. was the bomber. Yeah. For which I have no sympathy. Yeah, but the driver was so quick thinking, oh, yeah. locking that Remarkable. door and, yeah. Um, look, we're going to head for a break, but coming up, if your pension is giving you stress, don't go anywhere, because we'll be finding out how you can make the most of your pension plans and consolidate all the other oh, ones. Consolidate, that is the word. It is, yes. First, so here's your weather. Looking ahead to today's weather and the UK is looking foggy in the east, gradually clearing with some rain pushing into the west. Let's take a look at the details. So starting off in the southwest of England and here it's looking pretty wet this lunchtime. Rain will continue to edge eastwards but things will turn brighter through the afternoon. Meanwhile, in the southeast, the morning fog should have mostly cleared and some brightness may be breaking out for many, but it will be largely cloudy. Rain will have edged into western parts of Wales and it will be mostly light and should take a little longer to reach most eastern parts. But meanwhile, across the Midlands, it should be dry this lunchtime with the rain not set to arrive here until later on and it'll be mostly cloudy, though perhaps misty for some. It's also looking dry but cloudy around northeastern England. Here it will stay dry through much of the afternoon, though the cloud may be thick enough for a few spots of rain. There may be the odd spot of rain around eastern parts of Scotland. Meanwhile, further west, it's looking wetter, although the rain will not be especially heavy. The earlier rain will have cleared from Northern Ireland, so it'll be mostly dry here and the clouds should break up, meaning some sunny breaks are expected this afternoon. So the rain in the west will edge a little further eastwards this afternoon and it will be drier and brighter following on from that. And that's how the weather is shaping up for the rest of your Monday. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Welcome back at 6.24, still to come on the programme this morning. Well, from Rishi Sunak to Emmanuel Macron, the most powerful people in the world are currently increasingly <laughs> short. 
So, you may well ask, and you should ask, why is limb lengthening surgery on the rise? At 6.45, we'll speak to someone who's had the procedure, Gosh. as well as a limb reconstruction surgeon. Then at 7.15, are we on the brink of a property market collapse? We'll be speaking to an expert about what's behind falling house prices. So, get in touch the usual ways. Best, best one, drop us an email, gbviews at gbnews.uk. Or if Elon Musk allows you, send us a tweet <laughs> at gbnews. Now, would you believe a staggering £26 billion pounds of pension money is actually left unclaimed or lost in pots, according to the Pension Policy Institute? Oh, well, actually, Rishi Sunak could use a bit <laughs> of that. Dip into that, couldn't, that, couldn't he? Handy. Uh, well, how do we track and consolidate our pensions? Let's talk to Tom Selby, Head of Retirement Policy at AJ Bell. Good to see you this morning. Morning. Right, now, it's terrifying that there's 26 billion quid out there, which is unclaimed, mm. sitting in pension pots. How can this happen and what can we do to make sure it's not our money? So, the first thing to say is that £26 billion is money where the, the pension provider that's looking after the cash has lost track with the person whose money it is. So, that can happen for a number of reasons. It's usually if you move house, so you lose track... The pension provider might lose track of, of someone's address mm -hmm. and details so they don't know where they are, or if you switch jobs as well. So, people nowadays tend to switch jobs quite often. It can be... That's kind of once every year, once every couple of years, particularly for young people as well. And so what you end up with is lots of different pension pots building up with lots of different providers. Everybody loses track of them and people potentially aren't making the most out of their retirement pots right. as a result. Right, so how do you consolidate yeah, how that? how do you consolidate so, the phrase, the buzzword? Yeah, so it's not as easy as okay. you would like it to be sometimes. So one of the challenges is that you need to get your old employer schemes details in order to move your pensions to a single providers. So, to do that at the moment, you use what's called the pension tracing service. So, if you, as long as you've got your old employer's details, stick those into the pension tracing service. That'll give you scheme details. Then is you that could, free? That that's pension, free. Right, that's, that's free. government funded that's a gov scheme. Gov that's a government backed scheme. Now, there are reforms coming down the track that will mean that you can see all of your pensions in one place online and then you'll be able to consolidate a lot easier. Now, that's going to take a few years. It's going to be called Pensions Dashboards. I think it'll be a good innovation mm. for pensions. It'll help people connect with their pensions a lot more easily, mm. but it's just taken a few years to come So, what come do we make of these? Yeah. There are various apps out there and platforms mm -hmm. that claim they will consolidate all your pensions for you. What's the catch there, then? Are they charging you a fee for doing so? So, yeah, so any, any, any platform that's offering a service like that will be charging you, you a fee. They'll also obviously want to administer your money as well. So, if you're, if you're thinking about moving all your pensions into one place, one of the key things that you need to consider is the amount that you're paying in costs and charges. So, it can, it can quite, quite often seem like small differences. So, one provider might charge, say, 0.75% and one provider might charge 0.5%. But when you scale that over 20... 30 years, it can end up being tens of thousands of pounds extra cash in retirement. So, there are different providers that offer you different kinds of services, but there will be costs attached to that. So, it's just making sure you get the right one for you. And you mentioned, obviously, nowadays, you know, people change jobs and, and employers mm. all the time. And it is famously youngsters who take less interest in their pensions than other people. So, if there are youngsters watching this who've moved, mm. you know, do you think there is, is there a time limit on how long it can take till you can claim any money you might have lost track of in, in previous jobs? Or could you be 65 and thinking, oh, I remember I worked for, I don't know, the BBC or the NHS yeah. for 15 years when I was in my 20s? Yeah, yeah. So, so there's no need for anyone to worry about that. So the money is yours, it's your pot of money. It, it might be sitting with an insurance company that you've worked for 20 years ago, but it's still there. And as long as you can get the details of that money, then you'll be able to get it back. As I mentioned, pensions dashboards are going to make that all a lot easier for people. So even if you've got a really old pension from way back when, you'll be able to see that and combine it with, with something else. So, all of that process is going to get, get why, a whole well, lot easier. Well, why bother then combining it? Because presumably, as long as... Mm. If you can track them down and yep. update your details, they'll pay you out your pension. You'll just get lots of small checks, as it yep. were, rather than a big one. Right? Yeah, so, that, so the main... So, 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 what's the benefit to having yep. it all in one pension pot? So, so the, one of the main reasons that people generally do it is because <laughs> it's easier. So, having it... So, if you had five different bank accounts with five different banks, then that might be quite a complicated set of things to keep track of. So, having them all in one place is easier. And as I said, you can benefit quite significantly from reduced costs and charges. So, particularly when you're looking at older-style pensions, 
sometimes they'll have charged one, 1 1.5% or something like that. So in modern pensions, you shouldn't be paying any more than half a percent, certainly no more than 0.75%. And when you look at that difference in charges on a decent sized pot of money, if you're talking about £100,000 plus over the course of someone's lifetime, that's going to be a serious chunk of cash. Yeah. And gi given where we are at the moment, I think most people would want to save as much money as they possibly can. I do think it's quite scary when you look at pensions and you get your pension mm. um, prediction, what do they call it? Uh, the forecast. Your projection, right? yeah. Yeah. And you look at that and, and they turn around and say, well, this means if you, you carry on like this, you know, you could be getting £13,000 a year or whatever. And you think, well, blooming heck. Yeah. That's not a lot of money. How, what sort of target should you be setting for, you know, a, a, a sort of decent enough wage to survive on what sort of pension pot size do we need to accrue? So it's it's a difficult <laughs> question depends to answer because it depends well, on your yeah. life. So, so, so the, <laughs> a, an organisation called the PLSA came up with what's called the retirement living standards and the idea behind that is to give people a rough idea of how much <clears throat> different standards of living will cost in retirement. So if you want a very basic standard of living, they reckon it's just over 10 grand for a single person. If you want a, a moderate standard of living, they're talking about kind of 20 grand. And if you want a comfortable standard of living, so lots of holidays, lots of luxury and things like that, you talking about just over £30,000. £30,000 in today's money. In today's money per year. So in terms of the size of pension pot that you'd need for those different amounts, you'd be taught, I mean, if you're, if you're looking at a healthy 65-year-old to have that comfortable standard of living, you're probably going to be looking north of six, £700,000, something like that, in a pension pot. Now, that... Now that shocked you, hasn't it? That is, that is, I'm not retiring any time soon. <laughs> that is going to sound terrifying for a lot of people. There's two things to think about there. Firstly, you've got your state pension on top of that. So the state pension provides just over £10,000 a year of guaranteed income. So you've just got the extra £20,000 to make up. And it's that if you're, if you're looking to save up a decent amount of money, and we're talking about the top end there, then it's about saving regular and often. So something like 500, 600,000 pounds can sound like a huge amount of money, but actually, if you just, if you make sure you're topping up your pension by as much as you can afford, very difficult for people at the moment, but if you've, even if you can add an extra 50 pounds, 75 pounds per month to it, over the course of your lifetime, that money can grow and you can end up getting a decent amount in retirement. Good advice, Scary Tom figures, Head of Retirement Policy at AJ Bell. Thank you, as always. Lovely to see Thank you. Thank you. Six, seven hundred grand. <sighs> well, bear in mind, that's not just your own money, though, is it? That's money that, that your employer, employer will put it. And am I right in thinking that total, there, you, what you're using in that total is, is how it's gaining on the market as well? So you don't actually have to... That's not the amount of money you have to put no, in. No, so you would, get, you would gain some from the market as well. Yeah. You get tax relief from the government as well. And as you well, say, you'll get your matched employer contribution. You might get tax relief from the government. We shall see on Thursday. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> that might all change. Yeah. Um, lovely, Tom. Thanks Thank very you. much indeed. Coming up after the break, we're going to be going through the papers. We've got Christopher Biggins and Dawn Neeson here this morning. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Every Friday and Sunday night from nine, it's Mark Dolan tonight. We're on the same page again. Great, There's something great, great happening. Let him finish. Don't be such a cranky. <laughs> that mini budget was the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> and on Saturday, my show just got bigger. From eight, it's Mark Dolan's Saturday Night In. You can't govern a country if you can't speak. <laughs> Stop talking. My God, we reached the end. I've never been early in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Only on GB News, the People's Channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner Today from 10am. There's never been a more interesting but also critical time in British politics and I can't wait to bring you the biggest stories of the day with the best factual accuracy and also a few of my own opinions thrown in. We'll engage in passionate but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Monday to Thursday, 10 till 12, on TV, on radio and online. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. 
At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Six thirty-five. <laughs> Biggins is there. Just chin wagging. Tell. Don't mind. Um, let's bring up. There he is. Having a riot, ladies and gents. Let's bring up to date with some of the key stories today. The UK and France are set to seal a historic deal to tackle the migrant crisis as small boat arrivals top 40,000 so far this year. The two countries are expected to sign an agreement aimed at stopping people illegally crossing the English Channel. The Prime Minister has vowed to deliver on market expectations in the autumn budget on Thursday. Rishi Sunak says the Chancellor will unveil measures to put our public finances on a stable trajectory. It's after Jeremy Hunt warned that everyone will have to pay a bit more tax to stabilise the economy. A survey has found more than a quarter of football fans say they're feeling anxious about how much they might lose whilst betting during the World Cup. Gamble Aware has found six in ten people say there are too many gambling adverts during international tournaments. So let's go through those papers then this morning with former editor of the Daily Star, Don Neeson, and actor extraordinaire Christopher Biggins. Mm -hmm. Good morning, you two. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, <laughs> let's talk tax, Dawn, in the Times, just to cheer us up on a Monday yeah. morning. I'll tell you what, though. Isn't there a sense, and I know no believe you, I mean, I know nobody likes paying taxes, but don't you think there's a sense there that we think, we're all st starting to think, well, if we don't pay a bit more, we're all screwed, basically? I think, uh, yeah, I, th I think, unfortunately, you're right. Um, and as Rishi Sunak has said in this interview, um, picked up on by the Times and all the papers, that, you know, Britain will be punished by the financial markets if we don't sort the... the financial black hole out, which is 50, 55 or 60 billion, depending on who you talk to, yeah. what time of day it is. It seems to be going up by the second. So, I mean, it's it's the financial markets are running the country. We saw that with Liz Truss. Um, and it's almost like it's been cunningly planned, doesn't it? It's sort of like, get Liz Truss to go in first and really prove that sort of like, mm. you know, tax handouts don't work and then I can come in and take all, all the money from you. But... It, is it a Conservative government? I mean, we are now paying the highest taxes. And the one thing I think a lot of people will be worried about this morning is that the um, energy bill price cap will now be ending in April as well, which will probably result in another £600 for ordinary families out there as of April. And we don't know what the weather's going to be like. It's going to still be cold, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so, it, but, 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 but there is some little bit of look forward, stick with me, I'm mm. Rishi, isn't there? Jeremy Hunt will uh, um, also lay out longer term plans so that we actually, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, it does probably appear to be a train hurling towards us still. Um, but it's, and, and Sunak was speaking, uh, this is my favourite bit of this particular interview, he was giving this interview on his way to the G20 summit in Bali. Mm. Uh, and with the same group of people who have just been in Egypt discussing how <laughs> we're all destroying the planet by flying everywhere. Ah, yes. Well, I share your cynicism to some <sighs> degree. However... Oh, there's always a however with when it, Steve. When it comes to sorting out the uh, chaos that we're in at the moment, it seems pretty clear that there will be some backroom dealing between diplomats from everywhere else and Russia, which could be a step forward. Which is, if, yes. if we sort that out, then everything else is going to get Steve, easier. But Stephen, do they have to do it in Bali? I know, well, that does look like a nice... Death, a Sharm El Sheikh to Bali. Yeah, it's like I the mean, sunshine you know, tour of the, <laughs> the globe. Well, Indonesia's, <laughs> Indonesia's got the presidency. Oh, stop being so <laughs> good to them. Let's have a whinge. It's a Monday morning. Oh, but, no, believe you me, when this came out, he was going to Bali, I whinged all weekend, so I'm just <laughs> trying to be reasonable now. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Begins, you want to talk about the mail. Extraordinary story on the front of the mail this morning about I... A&E chief. What's he saying about his parents? Well, Adrian Boyle, uh, the new president of the Royal College of Emergency Medicine, saying that he wouldn't uh, send... If his parents went into hospital, they wouldn't come out again, which is a terrifying thing to say, a man in that position. But I think he's possibly right. I mean, I think it's, it's so badly run. I think what we should do with the, uh, the A&E is 
people, I, I had two operations last year on the national health, which was fantastic. I should have paid something. Not the huge fees, but a, a token fee for having those operations. Mm. And I think that's what we should do. People should not, it shouldn't be, it should be free for certain people. But if you can afford it, you should pay. But, but aren't you paying already through your taxes? I know, but insurance? I think but I think if you have an operation which costs £25,000, which can, they can do nowadays, I think you should pay at least £1,000 towards it. That's what happens in Australia, funnily enough. Is it? Yeah. yeah, so when people go to have babies, you're basically encouraged, you know, if you can afford it and you've mm. got a yeah. decent job, you should really be going private and paying for it rather than leaning on the state And also in Germany, for which it. has one of the most successful healthcare systems in Europe, and they have a small, like, you take out a small private insurance. But, I mean, you're, you're treading on dangerous ground, because as soon as you start even discussing mm. that area, it's, oh, you're privatising the NHS. No, because it's quite clearly not working. working. Well, yeah. except the whole point, the whole basis of the NHS, which is what you have the struggle to get over, is free at the point, point of, of care. Yeah. I know, but that I, we've been used used to this for the whole of our lives, mm. and I think it's wrong. I think that's where, and there are. Uh, the, I think the administration side of the NHS is so bad. I mean, you know, there are certain things which, you know, I was offered an ambulance to get me to to go to the hospital to have. Um, some uh, work done on my leg, and why can't I? Why couldn't I get myself to the hospital? Mm. Why do they provide that? I think it's just a waste of money somewhere mm. yeah. along the line, and I think that should be sorted out. And it's, but it's a horrible thing which he said. And I, but I, you know, he says they're like lobster traps, easy to get in but hard to get out. Yeah. Oh. We've all got stories like that, haven't we? And yes, of course, this we all have. links back to politics and what's happening. Yeah. What's going to be announced on Thursday? Rishi obviously wanted to increase national insurance to pay for uh, social care, which is where a lot of these people need to go, but they, yeah. there's nowhere for, for so-called bed blockers it is, to be it is released. A, the phrase bed blockers always makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. We are referring to elderly people, firm yeah. people and it's not their fault. I yeah. mean, it is the care system at fault. And as our um, Dr Boyle points out, I mean, people earn more moving boxes around in the Amazon warehouse than they do moving old people around in our care system. And I mean, I've got a friend who works in a care home and she says the way it, it's run, the whole system and the amount of money that carers are earned, who, who work incredibly hard and do a very, very tough job, is appalling. And you can't make it financially viable, especially if you've got a family yourself. So it's the care system that needs sorting out. And, you know, but moving on to the, <coughs> excuse me, the Daily Mirror, which mm -hmm. is on the same subject. I mean, last chance to save our NHS. Now, to my mind, newspapers, are not just the Mirror, but have been doing this headline for at least probably 30 say, years now. It's not new. It's not new, Stephen. Um, and it's, you know, another, pretty much the same as the Mail. But, I mean, it's sort of like, you know, you know, people are waiting in ambulances, and it's it's a bed blocking story, but on a different angle. And you know, this is the uh, Unite Union saying we need more money now. But I mean, how? I mean, they want seven billion more next year. I mean, where is this money coming from? Exactly. You know, you can you can increase national insurance, and that's not going to go well. I mean, even Keir Starmer's having doubts well, about that. Are they wrong though, in the sense that we're finding we expect that the triple lock is going to stay in place, which is going to cost us we're finding eleven billion yeah. pounds to pay for that on Thursday. So is seven billion more unreasonable? But where do you stop? Well, it's seven. Uh, I mean, and, and as Chris yeah. has already pointed out, I mean, you know, the NHS, so the way it's run and managed at the moment is 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 appalling, the amount of waste that goes on. I mean, you know, there are 500 pen pushers on over £100,000 a year while we're struggling to pay nurses, yeah. who, you know, entry level is 23000 but the average salary is about 30000 in this country. So we're struggling to pay the people that are actually doing the work on the ground floor, but we are paying diversity managers and managers oh, yeah. who who aren't. And, and when I had this debate the other day, someone said, oh, yeah, but they're, they're nurses that have worked their way out. No, a lot of them aren't. They are managers. They have yeah. no experience of actual health care per se. And they're quite clearly not doing a good job. So stop paying the people at the top £200,000 a year and start paying the people actually doing the work. And the junior doctor is on, what, early 30s, thousands mm -hmm. a year? Mm -hmm. uh, start paying the people actually doing the work. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more with you, and I think it's it's terrible. I mean, nurses, they work so hard, and they're put under tremendous strain. 
and they get, at the end of the day, they can't afford to eat. I know. Mm. That terrible. is what is so terrible. Mm. You know, there's something must be done about it. And, and this idea that everybody's going to be paying more taxes as of Thursday, and that includes, includes these very, well, very, very hard-working, yeah. struggling to survive well, nurses. Many of, yeah, many of them are paying £3,000 a year just to park their cars at yeah. the hospitals they work at. No, yeah, ridiculous. I mean, and we wonder why there's a retention problem uh, in, yeah. in nursing. Um, well, going from health to the former health secretary, <laughs> um, in the ex Former? Yes, former, thank <laughs> goodness. Matt Hancock, what's he been getting up to now? Well, if I was... Oh, excuse me. If I was in the jungle, and I was in the jungle uh, 12 years ago... You were king. Was, I was you king. Won. I won. And deservedly uh, so. Oh, thank you very much. And I loved it. I, I really loved it. But if I was in there with him... I'd be furious because he's taking all the it's time. The Matt Hancock show. It's, mm. It is exactly the Matt Hancock show. Mm. He's it, he's so far he's done every trial, and the awful thing is he's done it rather well. Mm. And that is what is so interesting. If he wasn't Matt Hancock, we'd be saying, "Oh, isn't he, isn't it great?" But if I was the others, I mean, some people just haven't got a look in in this show, and they've made this effort to go all the way to Australia. I know they've been paid, some of them have been paid a lot of money, but, I mean, even so, it's it's just appalling. And he was so... My hair looks terrible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just compare it to mine, sweetheart. You'll be fine. Just had a look there. No, I mean, I, and last night was a prime example. I mean, he was uh, bitten by a scorpion. Well, the scorpion was tiny. You know, it was a minute uh, And had baby. to have therapy afterwards yeah, as yes, well, that scorpion, by the way. I know, and, but he's, you know, every moment of the programme is taken up with But him. that's the fault of the viewers voting him yeah, in, is it? And the fault that. of ITV for how they're editing it, isn't Well, it? of course it is, but, I mean, you know, I, I, they're saying in one of the papers today that he will be first out, and I think that would be the marvellous thing if he was the first out. Well, what will be interesting to see is if it does go any way to repair his reputation, because I've noticed the tide beginning yes, to turn on social media. Media. Right. Well, I, that people I, are saying actually he's done rather well. And, oh gosh, he's quite a good sport. And yeah, anyone's got he's the winning people over. Quite anyone that's got the brass neck to go in there after what he's done. Uh, it, of course, it, you know, eating a kangaroo's willy is going to be no problem whatsoever, is it? I said willy live on Breakfast Daily. <laughs> well, it's not going to be a problem for someone like him, is it? It's just going to just plough on through it. And I, I'm just sitting there watching Mike Tindall, who's obviously an alpha male and really wants to get on with things. I'm just waiting for him to explode. Well, I think... And, and also, he's, he's, when, when they first went in, he was on my list of the top three. Yeah. Mm. And he must be furious. Yeah. Absolutely. Because he's not getting anything. And I think he's brilliant. He's a wonderful guy. I also love the uh, the, fo the lady footballer. Oh, she's great. Yeah, 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 yeah. She And she's That's wonderful. She could easily win. But, I mean, it's... It, it, I, I, he won't win. We know that. He will not Are win. You sure? I'm sure he yeah. won't win. I mean, I'd be... If he does, I'll eat my um, Australian hat. You know, whatever it is. The, the, the stupid thing about this whole thing is that more people are voting for Hancock to do these stupid things in the jungle than vote for Rishi Sunak to be PM. And that's mm. the sort of country we're living in at the moment. It's a bit weird, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. It's very weird. Mm. Um, just for um, Biggins' entertainment, let's talk Ronaldo Dawn. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, Biggins, song. would you like to take this one on? Oh, I'd like to take something on. Honestly, I think he's gorgeous. <laughs> Don't you think he's gorgeous? It's what In a sort of... Uh, yes, I suppose. Yes, oh, no, yes, he, yeah. he wouldn't I think have if to... you could take away his personality, he's, he's quite gorgeous. He's 100% heterosexual, so you've got no chance. But he's very, oh. very <laughs> sulky. <laughs> Any case, this is the son... Dawn, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> this is the son who's got... A, a, who have got an exclusive interview with Ronaldo, um, conducted by his best mate, Piers Morgan. Um, and he's saying he's feeling... It's, it's a sports interview. What it's doing on the front page, I don't know. How well this will sell, I don't know. Should be a back page story. Um, he's feel betrayed by Man United because they haven't treated him very well. Um, they showed a lack of empathy over oh, his, his, his baby passing away, which was obviously desperately sad. Um, and everything that goes wrong with the club now, they are blaming him personally, so he feels like the black sheep. People, he's on £26.8 million a year. <laughs> That's about £515,000 a week. And he's complaining. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, I would cope. I would cope with that. Maybe. Yeah, I'd cope with that. Sheets. So would I. I. Might even pay for my own operations, big into that. Right, I think uh, we're going to call time on that pay per view. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have more from both of these lovely people uh, just after half past seven. Christopher and Dawn for now. Thank you both very much. Talking of operations, actually, do you ever feel oh my goodness. that you are that you are too short?
Well, for many young men, apparently, it's a serious concern, which is leading to a demand for cosmetic leg lengthening. <laughs> and that's increasing. I, I, I'm astounded by it. Well, thanks to advances in technology, you can now more easily add several inches to your height. But ah, height, do you it think is. it is a step too Biggins. far? Christopher Biggins. <laughs> uh, we're going to speak to two people who know about all of this. Uh, we've got Craig Robbins uh, on the line for us. He's a limb reconstruction surgeon. And Victor Egonu, um, who actually had the leg lengthening surgery. So very warm welcome to both of you. If I, mar if I may start from a sort of surgeon standpoint in all of this, I mean, there is a danger, and certainly just, you know, as somebody who's coming to this completely new, I'd, I'd never heard of this until today, is there a danger now that we are preying on people's insecurities and, and exploiting perhaps some, some of society's sort of superficial obsessions? So that's a great question and it's a pretty complicated answer. We're not actively seeking these patients. These patients are coming and finding us. They're doing their due diligence on the internet. And a lot of these patients, if, if not all of these patients are coming to us and saying that depending on their age, they've had five, 10, 15, 20 years of having this sense that their height is not what they need to be to make their life more fulfilling and, and feel better about themselves. And we call this height dysphoria. So patients can have this height dysphoria that's limiting them in their self-confidence and their ability to participate with their peers. And after they have this procedure, should they choose to undergo this, that height dysphoria is uh, greatly diminished or even gone. And they're living their life, their best life that they feel after they undergo this procedure. Okay, Victor, what's your story then? I mean, how tall were you? How tall are you? Why did you feel the need to do this? So, Stephen, great question. So I actually got it done for a medical reason because uh, I had one leg shorter than the other one. Uh, however, I started the platform Cyborg for Life. It's a YouTube channel to actually interview the men who do get this done cosmetically to gain inches in height. The primary, re primary reason they get it done is because of dating. They're trying to partner a relationship. Um, and that's probably the number one reason they get it done. Statistics show that guys who are a few inches shorter below the average height for their given country are 75% more likely to be rejected by women. And uh, if they're a few inches above average height, they're 90% more likely to be accepted. So I find that's one of the major reasons why they get it done. It's fascinating. I was just reading in the, uh, the British papers over the weekend a, a really unpleasant comment about our, our new Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak. He's quite a diminutive man, if I can put it that way. And I was reading just a total pol political story. And that comment was just thrown in there from a backbench Conservative MP saying, um, oh, you can tell that this Prime Minister has a growth problem and I'm not just talking about the economy. And that's just considered an acceptable comment and that's coming in a you know totally irrelevant sector, you know, talking about politics there, not even, he's not even a film star or anything. So is that something that, you know, people encounter on a day-to-day -day basis, that it's OK to, to mock somebody because they're not tall? And that question to you, Victor. Yeah, I think so. I think that these guys, these young guys, they're uh, facing this ridicule when they go out into social uh, public events, um, holiday parties. A lot of them will actually refrain from going to these, you know, social events because they feel so um, captivated by their height, their stature. So that's why they're putting in this large investment of money, time, physical effort to go through this demanding procedure uh, to get these inches in height. And I can tell you from talking to several patients that with a resounding yes that it does make a difference in their lives so uh, what are you left with craig in terms of i mean obviously you, you're getting a few more inches but what are you left with in terms of, of of rehabilitation in terms of scarring in terms of ongoing pain i mean it's it sounds like it's a very difficult procedure so the, the procedure is difficult mainly and it's a time commitment so for this procedure the, the amount of time to obtain the length is related to how much length you're gaining. So an average patient coming to West Palm Beach will spend between two and three months with us. And during that time, they're gaining their length approximately one millimeter per day for a maximum total of eight centimeters, which in, in standard is 3.1 inch. 
they come to us for that three months. They're doing daily physio with us, and then they return home. And over the next several months, as their bone heals, they return to their normal activities. And by about nine to 12 months, depending on how much length they gain, you wouldn't be able to tell somebody walking down the street has had this surgery. They've recovered fully back to their normal activity. The scarring is very minimal. My, my partner and I, and uh, my partner in particular, have developed techniques over several years or decades to make the scarring quite minimal. And it's, it's a lot of surgery done through small scars. So it, it's a minimally invasive procedure, but it's maximally invasive in what we're actually doing through these small scars. You can risk getting a limp though through doing this, can't you? Getting, I'm sorry? A limp when you walk. Uh, well, in theory, yes, that, that can, but what we pride ourselves on at our institute is safety always comes first and the safety of the patient is paramount and that comes before anything else, including the amount of total length that may be desired. So by staying with us for the entire duration of your lengthening, you're evaluated every day by our physiotherapists. We have a fantastic team between the surgeons, the uh, clinical staff, the physical therapists, the administrators, the nursing, everyone you were talking about earlier. And we are all very keyed into the safety of the patients, not just related to the cosmetic side of these surgical procedures, but we have a whole host of orthopedic surgeons doing the whole breadth of, of types of surgery. So safety is our number one, regardless whether it's this cosmetic procedure or not. And it's important to note that this isn't just men. Probably 60% are men, which would leave 40% being women as well. And we have all ages ranging from uh, early 20s to 50s. Right. And just very quickly, oh, well, oh. do you have to break the bone to do it? I mean, just I don't know how yes. quickly you can explain that because we're really yep. out of time, but I'm just trying to understand how you do that. So the most common procedure we do is lengthening the femurs or the thigh bones. We can actually break the bone through just a small quarter inch, six millimeter incision, and we place a metal rod into the bone. So what you're looking at there is a picture of a shin bone. That's the tibia bone and the fibula bone is the smaller bone next to it. And if you could see that small gap in the bone, that's where the lengthening occurred. And, and that's just showing how the bone heals and returns back to 100% normal after the procedure and after the healing, your bone is just as strong as it was before the procedure. Fascinating. Okay. Craig and Victor, thank you both very much indeed. Thank you. It's interesting. Rishi, you're next five foot seven. Five foot seven. I mean, I think that's all right. It's fine, but I'm five for eight when I wear high heels and I met him. I'm quite a lot taller than him. But I think it's terrible the prejudice people have against shorter men. Um, but let me know, what do you think about that? What do you think about that procedure? I actually really do believe if something makes you feel better, why not? And if it's without risk or you, there's good evidence that it works, then why not? Mm, let us know what you think. GB Views at gbnews.uk. Top stories coming up after the weather. Looking ahead to today's weather and the UK is looking foggy in the east, gradually clearing with some rain pushing into the west. Let's take a look at the details. So starting off in the southwest of England, and here it's looking pretty wet this lunchtime. Rain will continue to edge eastwards, but things will turn brighter through the afternoon. Meanwhile, in the southeast, the morning fog should have mostly cleared and some brightness may be breaking out for many, but it will be largely cloudy. Rain will have edged into western parts of Wales and it will be mostly light and should take a little longer to reach most eastern parts. But meanwhile, across the Midlands, it should be dry this lunchtime with the rain not set to arrive here until later on and it'll be mostly cloudy, though perhaps misty for some. It's also looking dry but cloudy around northeastern England. Here it will stay dry through much of the afternoon, though the cloud may be thick enough for a few spots of rain. There may be the odd spot of rain around eastern parts of Scotland. Meanwhile, further west, it's looking wetter, although the rain will not be especially heavy. The earlier rain will have cleared from Northern Ireland, so it'll be mostly dry here and the clouds should break up, meaning some sunny breaks are expected this afternoon. So the rain in the west will edge a little further eastwards this afternoon and it will be drier and brighter following on from that. And that's how the weather is shaping up for the rest of your Monday. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's news channel.
Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deeds and Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness, really? And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. The number of migrant crossings this year passes 40,000. Good morning. It's just after 7 o'clock. It's Monday, the 14th of November, and you're watching and listening to Breakfast on GB News with Stephen and Isabel. Here's what's leading the news for you this morning. And the number of migrants making the journey across the Channel from France this year has hit 40,000, according to the MOD. Just under 1,000 making that journey on Saturday. It's reported the Home Secretary is expected to sign a deal with the French government today. The Chancellor has warned that everyone will have to pay more tax under his new economic plans due to be published on Thursday. Jeremy Hunt is reportedly looking to raise £20 billion in taxes. He feels betrayed by the club. Cristiano Ronaldo speaks out about his experience at Man United as he claims the manager, Eric Ten Hag, is trying to force him out. And the King turns 74 today. The occasion will be marked by a rendition of Happy Birthday by the Household Cavalry and gun salutes across London. We'd love to hear from you this morning. Anything you want to talk about, absolutely anything you want to talk about, we would love to hear from you. GBviews at gbnews.uk. So our top story this hour, the number of migrants crossing the English Channel this year has now passed 40,000. Well, the figures released by the Ministry of Defence show a marked increase on last year when just over 28,000 crossings were documented. And it follows protests in London by thousands of Albanians in opposition to the Home Secretary's rhetoric on immigration. Well, let's talk to David King, who's uh, Lib Dem leader of Colchester Borough Council. Uh, good morning to you. It's nice to see you this morning. Uh, yeah, good look, morning with these, to both with of these you huge too. increases uh, in the numbers of people crossing the Channel, what sort of impact does that have on an area like Colchester? Well, we're quite a distance um, from the south coast, so it's not a direct one. Uh, it's a rare thing to have migrants up on the east coast it's much more on the south coast for obvious reasons it's the it's the shortest sea route but then we have the home office system which takes people uh, as we can see at manston doesn't process them well or swiftly and then disperses them uh, and um, i've recently been out of sorts about this because we're a good partner as we should be for local government and we're a very welcoming place a place of sanctuary we're proud to help people and we have uh, for many years taken more than our fair share. But what happens 
is that the system doesn't work well. So you get an incoherent process, people turn up um, almost literally overnight, you get an advance notice of hours or a day or so uh, for 100 or 200 people. And this will be happening elsewhere, but it's happened here. We have twice as many or more uh, than other parts of Essex. And as I say, we're a welcoming place, but it's the incoherence means that people turn up with many problems, many issues. Some of them have been held, like at Manston, then they moved on, then they're with us. And what do we do? Mm. Uh, where's the support we can provide with a no-notice approach? And like everywhere else, uh, we've got our own pressures. We've got residents to support. We will, as I say, welcome and integrate uh, refugees and asylum seekers as best we can. But it's a, it's a strain and it's a struggle. And frankly, it's not good government. Um, a number of councils now have been taking legal action over the last week or so to try and stop the use of these hotels at such short notice by the Home Office. I think councils in Yorkshire and Ipswich have both been unsuccessful recently, but there are six other councils involved. Have you thought about going down that road or are you going down that road? Well, we absolutely have thought about it and we'll keep an eye on it. Um, what you have to do is the right thing. So. The injunctions are being sought for reasons you probably understand, which is a misuse, you know, a, plan, a planning fail from a hotel to a hostel in an inappropriate place and location. Um, they've failed for, because that, the harm that that demonstrates is, is minor. Um, we're not going to do it. Uh, what we're going to do is provide the wraparound support and the care, the, the help with getting a GP, the help with mental health. We're going to get the system we're a a part of, and we do it well, to coordinate and respond. What we want from government, what we really want, is not the need to have an injunction. We want a process that helps people, once they're here, have their status established and then helps them uh, with their next steps in life. And local government uh, is the place where people will be living. We need the help, the financial support, and the time to go and provide them um, a the support assistance they need. That's what we need from government. Money, support, a long-term view and a processing of asylum seekers and others, migrants, and frankly, where we should and where we can are welcome for. Well, look, I mean, you're coming at it from a different angle. However, what is clear is we know what the, the government's position on illegal migration, these, you know, these increasing numbers, we know what the, the government's position is, even though we're awaiting a bit more action. The, the Labour Party has hardened its position from what Keir Starmer was saying a couple of weeks ago. You as a Liberal Democrat are clearly unhappy with how the system's working. I mean, you're all in agreement on some level, which seems to indicate that it's not just not working, it's totally broken at the minute. Well, it is remarkable that one of the, what used to be called one of the great offices of state, the Home Office, is once again by a new Home Secretary considered to have failed. You know, it's a it's a broken, it's a broken, not for fit for purpose State Department. It's focused upon keeping people out, not that successfully. It's not focused upon accepting that people will continue to flow into the country. And I understand why. But it's got to respond to those that do arrive and it's got to accept its responsibilities to process them swiftly, properly, humanely. But forgive and me. And give those of us who welcome them the support we need to do that well. Forgive me, do you accept, though, that it can't continue at this rate? I mean, to go up from 28,000 crossing the channel last year to 40,000 already this year, I mean, that's just... I mean, you say you welcome them in Colchester. I mean, other Lib Dems have got a, um, a, a pretty liberal approach on, on migrants, but, however, that is... It's just not sustainable at that, that level, is it? Well, the reason that I've made a fuss about this is for the same is for the, the same drivers that when people arrive again with little notice, but even if they arrive with notice, there's a pressure on housing, on on health, um, on education, um, on the need for simply to translate and then to process their applications, give them support. So it's an extra pressure for a, for local government, and we've got loads, and we haven't got resources to do it. So I'm not in a different position to my colleagues. Nor am I in a different position from most political parties, certainly here in our part of the world, where we uh, accept um, and uh, our responsibilities and we'll help and support people wherever they come from. But we have got a duty to the residents that are here. So it's about balance. But back to your original point, there's no 
there is no sense in us pretending that saying it will be so, that it will stop or it shouldn't happen, is going to stop it happening. They can put lots of coppers on beaches in Normandy or anywhere else they like, but that won't stop the gangs flowing people across. And many of them, when their applications are processed, are allowed to stay. I'm not arguing for that. I am arguing for realism and a view that's better than a headline. So sending people to Rwanda is a headline so far, isn't it? It's not a real approach. It well, yeah, it's to, supposed to work as a deterrent, but as we know, that that has been stopped right. uh, on human rights grounds. But David King, look, it's a huge, huge subject. We have to leave it there. Leader of Colchester Borough Council, uh, Liberal Democrat. Really good to get your thoughts this morning. Thank you. Interesting one. You're going to have a view on that, I would imagine. <laughs> GB News at GBNews.uk. Now, the Chancellor has warned that everyone, each and every one of us, is going to have to pay more tax as he prepares to unveil the autumn statement this Thursday. Well, the Chancellor's reportedly preparing a package that would see £20 billion of tax rises and £35 billion worth of spending cuts. Speaking yesterday, he said that although tax rises would disappoint people, he would protect the most vulnerable. Yeah, well, let's talk to broadcast editor at The Spectator, Cindy Yu, who's here. Good to see you this morning. I mean, he's being realistic, isn't he? I mean, I know it's, it's not what any of us want to hear... However, there is a sense of saying, well, at least we're, he's telling it how it is. Yeah, I mean, we've just lived through some of the most expensive times in modern history with the pandemic, two, three years of that, now with the Russian invasion, rising energy prices across the world. So to expect not to, you know, have some kind of compromise, some kind of sacrifice on living standards, I think would be extraordinary. And maybe under Prime Minister Boris Johnson, that would have been the message that he was giving across. But I think it's very important for Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt to kind of manage expectations so that nothing on Thursday comes as a surprise. Now, it will still be a bumpy day, though. A, a very bumpy day. And I suppose the, the fear is, as the Bank of England is warning, we are heading into a recession, that to have tax rises and spending cuts at a time like this, you will make the pain deeper for a lot of people and could make it worse. Yeah, and that's the fear of a lot of senior Tories as well. You've seen some of them breaking rank, people who uh, in a previous era supported Liz Truss, Simon Clark, for example, uh, a senior Tory MP. But at the same time, I think the government is almost accepting that a recession is going to happen. Mm. And Jeremy Hunt has talked about how he wants a recession to happen, but happen uh, quicker and shallower than it otherwise would have been. And the way that he thinks to do that is to bring down inflation, which is what they're doing with their tax rises and spending cuts, because that's definitely going to depress the economy a but little it's, bit. But it's, it's looking longer term, isn't it, that we need? And I wonder how much I was saying to our last guest on, on this issue... I wonder how much we're talking about the autumn statement mm. and he's thinking about the spring statement yeah. in terms of thinking, well, we, it's, gonna, it's a very bitter pill now, but perhaps some of this can be eased off come March, April. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if that's quite optimistic, March, April time, maybe this time next year well, <laughs> it can no, be, I'm, yeah. I'm but hoping for the best, Cindy. But certainly, they, I think they're going to want to have a more positive message before the next election mm -hmm. in two years' time. So this is the pain now, and then in a year's time, maybe they can get, roll out something more promising. But even this week, I think Jeremy Hunt will talk about some future tax cuts. But that's the kind of rhetoric that mm. Rishi Sunak has used before, you know, when he was Chancellor himself. He said, yeah, tax cuts are coming down the line, and... You know, it's a question of whether or not people believe him. Yeah, I think it's really interesting always um, in situations like this to talk about the sort of our comparative position. And I know growth, we're doing pretty badly compared to other G7 nations at the moment. But GDP of Germany expected to go down significantly. Huge problems of inflation in the Eurozone, places like Germany mm. and Italy. Um, the United States got high, high interest rates and, and mortgages awful over there. So I suppose we're all in a bit of a bind at the moment. Absolutely, absolutely. The entire West, arguably the entire world, is going through an economic slump. And this kind of thing just, you know, happens because it's the boom and bust, isn't it? Um, and obviously, the Russian invasion has brought that on mm. everyone because it has completely triggered this worldwide supply chain and energy crisis. Mm. So I think that's going to be Rishi Sunak's main message at the G20 as he goes there today, to say, look, we're all in this together, we've got to work together to try to solve some of these problems. And I think inflation absolutely is a problem worldwide, not least because we've been printing money since 2008. Mm. Mm. So everyone's chickens are coming home to roost. Mm. I wonder, because uh, this is politics as, as much as it's economics because the two are indivisible, really, aren't they? How, how does the Labour Party play politics with this? Because, I mean, if they were in office tomorrow, 
they couldn't do anything much different, could they? No, I know, and that's the funny thing. I mean, this energy price guarantee, you know, it was a Labour policy, it was a Labour proposal before Liz Truss took it on earlier this year. Um, the windfall tax was also a Labour policy, so, you know, that's the thing about the Conservative Party, which is just that they kind of... Uh, consume all of these other suggestions from other parties and take the credit themselves or, or the blame. Mm. But for Labour, it is hard to criticise a high-spend government. I guess Labour can only say, well, we're going to do growth better. But again, there's not enough detailed suggestions. Labour's lead at the moment has only just come from the Tory civil war. It doesn't come from anything positive that they've done themselves. Mm. Any possible sort of problem areas that you foresee on Thursday? I mean, we've talked a lot on the programme about the triple lock and I suppose, you know, it always comes down to the question about are all pensioners... Is this a bit of a crude way of helping pensioners? Because we know a lot of pensioners are, are not well off and they really need that triple lock. But of course, 30% of them are, are millionaires. We're not in the same situation we're talking about nurses. You know, how many nurses are millionaires and yet they are going to have to pay more taxes according but to the But the thing chancel. about that is that it's expensive but popular with the voters, especially mm. with Conservative voters, for obvious reasons. I think what is actually going to be a, one of the bigger problems is the council tax rises that we might be seeing as well. I mean, everyone pays a lot in council taxes. Mm. Services are not necessarily getting better. And yet, as we've heard from David King, services are getting more demanding from the council's perspective. So Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt are looking to increase those council taxes, but we've already seen polls that show that that's actually very, very unpopular with the majority of voters. So that could be one of the things that is actually the most regressive to the targets the poor the most mm -hmm. um, in a budget that is trying to be fair. Yeah. How do I mean? How much of, of all that we're going to see is going to be um, sort of headline taxes, if you like, and, and how much is going to be... Um, and what's the term I'm looking for? But you know, fiscal drag. Fiscal drag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just from inflation going mm. up, not increasing the stealth tax. Yeah, yes. the, the tax threshold. Exactly. I think they're going to be doing a lot of that because they want to. I mean, Rishi Sunak is a political problem. He doesn't really have a technical mandate mm. to be prime minister. Boris Johnson does. He was voted in in 2019. Liz Truss does because she was voted by the Conservative leadership method. Rishi Sunak was kind of crowned, wasn't he? So mm. he wants to be as close to the 2019 manifesto as he can be mm. to kind of. We have some of that Boris Johnson's mandate there. And so he doesn't want to raise taxes where he can, but he wants to get more in tax revenue. Yeah. OK. Cindy, really good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. I'm trying to smile. I know. There's not a lot to because, smile about. Because... I'm trying to look at the positive. You know, financial stability, fiscal stability and responsibility... So ..is, yeah, very important. But we can't have it without it hurting yeah. at the moment. Yay. <laughs> Uh, look, with the time at 7.16, let's bring you up to date on the headlines this morning. And the International Trade Secretary is travelling to the States today to seek a UK-US cooperation deal on global economy and trade rules. Kemi Badenoch will call for a move towards more diverse and resilient supply chains, as well as investing in new technology to support jobs. Unite has warned the Prime Minister the autumn statement is his last chance to save the NHS. They said the health service is on the brink of collapse and they're asking the PM to act to avert industrial action and fix underfunding across the NHS. The King is celebrating his 74th birthday today. It's his first as monarch and is expected to mark his anniversary privately, but there will be gun salutes across London to honour the occasion. Now, it is a year ago today that Imad al Suyalmin blew up a taxi outside Liverpool's women's hospital. Now, although he was the only person to be killed in that blast, it shocked the country and was, of course, an act of terrorism. Well, the North West of England reporter Sophie Reaper sent this. An act of terrorism that rocked the nation. One year ago today, as people around the UK gathered to mark Remembrance Sunday, one man had other ideas. On the morning of November 14th, 2021, Imad El Swailmeen booked a taxi to take him from Rutland Avenue to Liverpool Women's Hospital. As the vehicle arrived at the destination, he detonated a homemade explosive device which engulfed the taxi in flames. Driver David Perry miraculously escaped. Swailmeen did not. One man who saw it all unfold was Darren Knowles, who was working as a hospital security guard at the time. I was just at the side of my car on my brake, pumping my tyre up because it had a bit of a flat tyre. Next minute, I seen a taxi rush in, and I looked over thinking, why was it speeding? Because you don't really see that at a hospital. And then next minute, I just heard a slight bang and saw grey smoke and black smoke. 
So like coming from the front of the car, so we ran over, saw the taxi driver get out, grabbed him, uh, tried to go back for his takings, his mobile phone and everything. And uh, I just held him back saying, no, it'll probably go up again. And he told me basically what had happened and there was a terrorist inside the car. How do you think the people of Liverpool were impacted by this act of terrorism? All of us just couldn't believe what happened, especially with it being a children's hospital where babies are born and young families and everything. We're just horrific, traumatised. It's a memory that I'm never, ever going to lose. It's just something I've got to learn to cope with. A year on, although the day-to-day -day may have returned to normal, there is a sense that things will never be the same at Liverpool Women's. In a statement, the hospital's chief executive said, whilst we can be grateful that the absolute worst did not happen, there is no escaping the fact that there was intent to cause significant harm. The scars on our buildings have diminished, but some of the deeper scars of that terrible intent remain. Now, although a full year has elapsed, the people of Liverpool will never forget this act of terror against their proud city. Sophie Reaper, GB News. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Um, look, we were talking about um, leg lengthening a little bit earlier on. Kylie's been in touch. Said, Have these men ever thought of dating a short woman? It wouldn't matter then. <laughs> well, that's what the Prime Minister's done, hasn't he? Because well, his wife's even more tiny. You love who you love, Kylie. Yeah, Tracy says, I'm a mere four foot ten, but all good things come in small packages. And Cheryl says, thinking you can fix everything in life through surgery is a harmful attitude to adopt. Love yourself first or nobody else will. I think it's crackers. I've got to be honest, I think it's crackers. If you're short, you're short, what does it matter? I think it is crackers and you must not fixate on these things, but if it is... Fix, if you are fixating on it and it is consuming your every thought and actually it is inhibiting you then and there is a solution, then I'm all for people doing that. I would I never say don't do it. But I do think people shouldn't be so shallow. I'm not a big advocate of saying, oh, go for therapy. But, <laughs> if, you, but if you're really fixated on it, go for therapy. And then and rather than having surgery. I don't think it's the... I just think it's weird. Oh, look, What's Penny has said, short? as a woman, I wouldn't want to be any taller. At age 12, I was 5 foot 11 inches and was bullied and teased mercilessly by the boys mm. in my year. I also had the most difficult time of finding boyfriends, as I wouldn't go out with anyone shorter than me. Well, that's your own fault then, Penny. <laughs> that's your own but fault. But I do think it's equally difficult for very tall girls and women as it is, I suppose, for short men. Yeah. And my mum and her sister were, were very, very... Well, are very tall, but I think it was less common when they mm. were growing up in the 50s and 60s, and she always said they slouched and tried to cover up how tall they were. Whereas, you know, at university, I was the same height as all of my flatmates. I was, I'm 5'8". But it, and it all changes. I was always considered very... I'm six foot, and I was always considered very tall, like when I was at school. Oh, yeah. Whereas now, of course, they're all six foot four, or whatever. So, so, I mean, it's just that like, it, it changes. Does it matter? It's just a number? It's just a size? Oh, it's just nothing. Doesn't Don't matter. bother. No, anyway, I don't know. Um... I do think you're a lovely height, though. I do. <laughs> I shouldn't I say that, but I do think you're the perfect height. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, look, coming up, we're going to take you through all the sport in a couple of minutes. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. 
On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flop at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. Hello, I'm Esther Rackvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Hello, I'm Alastair Stewart and I'd invite you to join me at noon on Saturdays and Sundays for Alastair Stewart and Friends. I've been in this business for over 40 years. Now, here at GB News, I've never been happier. I get to choose the big stories that really interest me. We hear what you have to say, and you hear what I have to say. I really hope you can join me noon on Saturdays and Sundays. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. <laughs> Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Welcome back at 7.25. It is still to come on today's programme. At 7.45, we're going to be asking a professional PR person about Matt Hancock's jaunt in the jungle as the former health secretary is preparing to take on his sixth consecutive challenge tonight. It's the Matt Hancock show. You see, I say all that, I don't really know what any of it means. I've never seen <laughs> never the programme. Never watched it. It's a bit past our bedtime. At 20 past eight, Kate Hardcastle will be here. She's talking about the potential pitfalls of buy now, pay later. Lots of people get tempted to use this around mm. Christmas especially. Um, more companies have been introducing them as an option, um, so we'll be discussing whether or not that's a good thing to do in terms of personal finances. Buy on credit, isn't it? Even if it's free credit in some mm. cases. Um, we'd love to hear from you, as always. GBviews at gbnews.uk. Oh, do you know, I just fancy a box of chocolates, milk chocolates. Who could deliver me a box of milk chocolates? Oh, I see what you've done there. <laughs> Oh. Mickey. There you go. That's why I didn't, I didn't, I didn't realise the, the joke. That's why someone keeps asking me for a coffee cream earlier. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Could have at least brought some milk tray in with you looking yeah, at Yeah, no, I will, I will, don't worry. Excellent. Don't worry. I went to an 80s party earlier in the year and someone actually did come as, as, um, as the milk, the milk tray, tray man. It's easy, just dress in black and turn up with a bottle. Yeah, you've got your, you, of your outfit sorted. I know, exactly. Yeah. I, haven't wanted to, I haven't wanted to roll it for donkey's years. You you know, I thought very I'd... dapper. If anyone's Thanks listening on indeed. the radio, um, we've got a roll neck going on with a <laughs> twin, a double-breasted blazer. It's very sharp, Thanks very, very much sharp. indeed. Cheers, cheers. Um, Aidan, anyway, from one sharp person to another, Cristiano yeah. Ronaldo, very unhappy. Yeah, it broke late, um, late last night in some of the papers. It's gone to the front page where it belongs, quite frankly. It's a huge, huge story. Um, he promised he would have his... his convey his side of the story back in the summer when things were playing out, not necessarily from a PR point of view as he would want to, but he's come out last night and said that basically Man United have betrayed him. Now, the situation, as we know, with Ronaldo is that he's been in and out of the team this season, not really got on with the manager. He's trying to manoeuvre and engineer his way out of the club. But this interview is quite explosive. I mean, he's actually said things like he has no respect for the manager. He's in a weak position here a little bit because United are quite handily placed. They won yesterday. They're fifth in the table. The progress is generally incrementally going, going in the right direction. They're, they're, as I say, they're, they're on the edge of the Champions League places. If he, he'd be in a stronger position saying this if they'd lost, lost three in a row or something. Yeah. He said that 
Eric Ten Hag has no, has no respect for him, which is why he's not giving respect back. There's other things as well. He said is that he's not in breach of contract somewhere along the line. Well, he is, but I think he wants United to cancel the contract. These the, real life doesn't really come into these contracts, Stephen. You know, it's it's this is these are these are mega stars. These are there's no there's no benefit main, to Man United having an unhappy star on their hands. Not certainly not a superstar like him. He, I mean, the, it gets quite dark. I mean, he accuses the club of not supporting him during the problems he had at the start of the season with his, with his daughter. Remember, he lost a son earlier in the year as well. So that, that, that's, there's more yeah. to come on that later in the week. I mean, we, we can shed a lot more light on that as and when. Um, he said the club had made zero progress from when he left. I mean, he left in 2009. He said the canteen's still the same, the chefs are still the same. He said the chefs are pretty good, but they're working with the same stuff. You know, the same, the same kind of build, building, the swimming pool's the same. I would oh, say that... Oh, a shocker. <laughs> well, it, it, it is <laughs> awful. He's got to eat the same food. He's only got the same chefs and yes, the same Yeah, pool. I know, but this is elite sport. Man, all other clubs are overtaking oh. them. Tottenham have, built, right. Tottenham have built 100 million pounds, or, uh, no, several, 700 billion, million pound stadium since then. All so, of this is irrelevant, whether or not... Surely, if he's good enough to play... They would play him. The you problem know, you talk is, about him being a star, but is yes. he good enough anymore? Yes, he's not young. This, this is, no, he's not young, but this is the thing. So he scores goals, but he often scores goals when the team is not necessarily. It, it, people think that it's, it's all about him. Now, all clubs now, pretty much every club all around Europe plays in a certain way. It's about high pressing. So your forwards have to run around and chase down defenders. He's too old for that because he's. I wouldn't say his legs have gone, but he's not going to. He's not going to ferry into or you know scurry into channels and sh shut down defenders and goalkeepers and stuff like that. It's just not his game. And that's why he probably ended up at Manchester United, because in the summer of 2021, even when he's slightly closer to his peak then, than he is now, he didn't have anywhere to go. There were no options. Juventus let him go because he was too expensive. If you invite Cristiano Ronaldo and the circus that goes with him into your club, you've got to tear up any plans that you have, because whoever most clubs he goes into, he's probably going to be bigger than the club. In all honesty, mm. you know, he's, I mean, he's not bigger than United. United is, the, is, is perhaps the biggest club in the world, as you know. You're up from you're from up that neck of the woods, Stephen. You know what that club means to people locally and internationally. But he said that Ralph Ranick, as well, the the manager who took over this time last year, he said he wasn't even he, he was a sporting director. He wasn't even a coach. I mean, this is this, this calls into question. This is this is throwing a torch to the entire club, an institution like Manchester United, which he's been involved in now for nearly 20, 20 years, notwithstanding 12 years he spent apart from it. He still had a link with the club in that period. He said that the key people in the club not just don't, want, don't just not want him there, but they didn't want him back in the first place. But isn't this making it more difficult for him to go anywhere else? He's burning his career, isn't Yes, he? he is. Well, I don't think he's going to play for United again. So this, no. the, the timing is quite strategic. We're just about to go into the World Cup. He's got to link up with Portugal. I think he feels more comfortable talking now because when you're in that, within that machine, that apparatus of Manchester United, you do find yourself curtailed in terms of what you can say. He doesn't... And he, I mean, he played against Aston Villa last week. They lost 3-1. They got a good result yesterday at Fulham. But if he goes away now into the World Cup, he's going to be free of the shackles of United and the shadow... Uh, controlling everything he's saying, and he's come out and said this. This is completely calculated. It's engineered to get a move to try and cancel his uh, contract. The question is, though, where he goes. And his relationship with the Manchester United fans. I mean, like, how much do you take of someone just dragging your club through the mud? There's two sides of every story. Remember Roy Keane? He demanded higher standards. Maybe you could say that's what Cristiano Ronaldo is doing here. I think that in the fullness of time, he will re-establish his reputation at Manchester United. But for now, it's about getting out of that club. Oh. All right. Interesting. Aidan, thank you very much thank indeed. You. Good to see you. Ouch. Now, a new report has revealed the average price of a newly marketed home decreased by £4,000 in November. Well, research from Rightmove also says that first-time buyer sectors is continuing to be the worst affected. Uh, well, let's talk to property expert Russell Quirk. Morning to you. Good morning. What's this all mean, then? Well, I, I think we should be careful not to read too much into this. So this is one index, of which there are many, and this is one month's data. That's yeah. it. So before we start getting kind of too carried away, as some of the media do, insofar as this now being uh, the beginnings of a crash or something really, really serious, it really is not. So it's one month's data. Um, Rightmove famously also, their index is based on an analysis of asking prices. This is not transaction prices, in other words, what buyers are willing to pay. This is kind of seller sentiment, really. Um, and actually, in the Rightmove report, it also says that this is kind of seasonal norm, really. So when we get sellers listing at this time of the year normally, going into kind of end of the year, December, winter months and so on, Actually, in all of the years before the pandemic, mm. November house prices always reduce. So and it follows on from the mini budget, which which threw the market into some sort of chaos anyway. Yeah, and, but that's interesting because, of course, the big consequence of that was the effect that that had then on things like gilt yields and swap rates, which then dictate what happens with fixed rate mortgages. What we've seen over the last two or three weeks, and again, which is uh, you know perhaps not been quite as well reported as the uh, the aggravation of the Quateng budget originally, is the fact that the those 
those yields, those rates are all reducing substantially. So what we're now seeing in the market is fixed rate mortgages reducing in rate quite significantly. So will we see a ripple? Will we see some kind of waves over the next few months in the property market around kind of uh, uncertainty and some kind of sentiment issues? Yes. Will we see big price falls and a kind of an Armageddon type effect in the property market in 2023? Absolutely no. not. Uh, although I would say you are definitely a glass half full kind of guy, and you know what? Three would... quarters, I would say. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, oh, I, yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> and what would be the point and the incentive of Right Move to be putting it out there that there was a, you know, you're sort of questioning this one month's well, data, but they don't want to see a bubble either. No, I mean, of course, the, the reason, no disrespect to Right Move, they put this out in the first place is because it's great PR. You know, they, they do, uh, they compile this report and have done for several years. You know, based on grabbing a few headlines, and guess what? It's worked. Here we are. Mm. We're talking about it. Um, um, I guess what I'm saying is that we shouldn't look at this just in isolation and we definitely need to need to look at what are otherwise seasonal norms. Would you be advising people to sell at the moment or would you be advising them to weather what you were calling this ripple effect and leave it a few months because, you know, just I mean, let things settle? Honestly, seasonally, I would never advise someone to go into the market in kind of late November, December, because, of course, it quietens down naturally anyway. Um, should you think about this being the return, I guess, to a normal market? So, of course, we're used to reporting on this kind of pandemic frenzy where the property market has been really, really excitable. What we're going to see in 2023, from January onwards, is a, just a more normal market, so a kind of more balanced buyer versus seller dynamic, house prices that will probably float along between 1% to 3% in terms of uh, annual price rises, and, and what I would consider to be normal interest rates, you know, living with mortgage rates of one and a half to two percent. That's not normal. We've kind of got spoiled. We've got used to that. So 2023 uh, return to normality. Oh, well, there you go. That sounds all right, doesn't it? Uh, Russell, thank you very much indeed. Good to see thank you. Thank you. No need to panic, ladies and gentlemen. No need to panic. Just don't sell your house till next year. <laughs> After the break, we'll be bringing back uh, the cheeky Christopher Biggins mm -hmm. and Dawn Neeson to take us through your Monday morning newspapers. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. Every Friday and Sunday night from nine, it's Mark Dolan tonight. We're on the same page again. Great, There's something great great happening. Let him finish. Don't it be such a cranky. <laughs> that mini budget was the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> and on Saturday, my show just got bigger. From eight, it's Mark Dolan's Saturday Night In. You can't govern a country if you can't speak. <laughs> Stop talking. My God, we reached the end. I've never been early in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Only on GB News, the People's Channel.
Join me, Arlene Foster, for the briefing on GB News. Every Friday at 3 p.m., I'll give you all the latest political news and analysis, and we'll have a robust live debate. To make sure that you're caught up on all of the biggest issues of the day, we'll bring on experts in their field. I'll ask the questions that you'd like to ask. We're not afraid to tackle discussions from all perspectives, including yours. Don't forget The Briefing with me, Arlene Foster, every Friday at 3 p.m. on GB News. We are GB News right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing. You see, amazing. You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. Seven thirty-nine. Let's bring you up to date with some of the headlines this morning. And the UK and France have signed a historic agreement to tackle the migrant crisis, aimed at stopping people illegally crossing the Channel. It includes a boost to beach patrols and British staff in French control rooms for the very first time. It's as small boat arrivals topped forty thousand this year so far. The Prime Minister has vowed to deliver on market expectations in this week's autumn budget. Rishi Sunak says the Chancellor will unveil measures to put our public finances on a sustainable trajectory. It's after Jeremy Hunt warned everyone will need to pay a bit more tax. A survey has found more than a quarter of football fans are anxious about how much they might lose betting during the World Cup. Gamble Aware has found six in ten people say there are too many gambling adverts during international tournaments. Christopher Biggins and Dawn Neeson are back with us this morning to review your Monday morning newspapers. Um, Christopher, you want to start... Oh, I'm calling Christopher. It's very formal. Very formal. Um, Biggins, <laughs> I want to start with Remembrance Day. Um, it's been a few days, hasn't it, with Armistice Day on Friday and then the Cenotaph uh, ceremony and all sorts of ceremonies up and down the country yesterday. You've chosen the star, the front page, lest we forget. I know. I mean, I was in doing a charity in Manchester over the weekend. I was staying in a hotel and I switched the television on and there it was. And... I found it terribly moving. Yeah. I mean, it is extraordinary when you think... I remember my mother telling me that she was in the rafts and she would go out the night before and with the boys and they'd have a drink and they'd really have a good time and then they went off in the morning and they knew that half of them wouldn't come back. Mm. Mm. And that is what people did. And it was like sending... People to their deaths. Young men as well. Young mm. men. 16, 17, 18. Who hadn't had a life. Yeah. Mm. You know, and it was, it was somehow all the people there yesterday. And it's, if it ever stops, I think we're, we're done for. Because we must remember. Mm. And, you know, the king was there, our new king. And even when they sang God Save the King, I became emotional. I thought mm. the whole thing... There's quite, there is something quite emotional about hearing God Save the King. There is. Now, isn't mm. there? Much more than, funny enough, God Save the Queen. Uh, yeah. Which, I, I, I don't know why, but anyway, you're absolutely right. I think... But it, the, the whole thing was just wonderful. Mm. And we do it. We do that so well. We do yeah. the Queen's funeral so well. We do everything magnificently. Mm. I think that we didn't have the Queen this year added to the poignancy of the whole thing. Yeah, I, I mean, think... There were, there are fewer and fewer royals, which in one way is a good thing, money, da 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 But on the other hand, you looked at the balcony and there was just Camilla and Catherine. I know, it looked lonely, didn't it? It did look very I lonely. I thought that. And, um, and that brings me on to the, the other story that we've, we, you've already touched on um, this morning about uh, Kate on that balcony, Kate Catherine. And, and I thought she looked stunning. And yet the mirror's choice of page one picture... It's weird. Yeah, they've gone for a very unflattering picture. Very, very unflattering. Um, and you have actually... to question why they're doing it. And we, you know, I've been in newspapers for a long, long time, and you know exactly why they've done that, because they don't want to be nice to the royal family mm. in one mm. sense. So it's, it's just a bit unfair, because it's mm. obviously... It's taking away from the poignancy, as Christopher Biggins... Oh, God almighty, Mr Biggins <laughs> has already discussed. I mean, and it's like... I mean, I, I went to a remembrance service down in Folkestone, where the Gurkhas are based, um, and they were leading the parade, and Folkestone was the harbour that many of the young... the very young men going out to the First World War... First World War went from. They went on the, uh, on mm. the boats from Folkestone Harbour. 
many of them, obviously, we know, never came back. So it's a particularly poignant area, got a remembrance road, and the Gurkhas leading it. And I'm just thinking, it's like, we, we can't ever forget. And one yeah. of the other things I heard on social media this morning about Kate was, well, what's she remembering for? She's only 40, and it's like... Oh, no, the, no, 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 that's not how it works. Yeah, yeah. Is that? um, look, we're going to take just a short break because um, the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, has, as we now know, said a second ago, signed this new deal with the French to mm. try to deal with migration. She's just been talking. We take a multi... Uh, dimensional approach. There's no single answer, there's no quick fix, there's no silver bullet. Uh, our cooperation and collaboration with the French on the Channel, uh, on the UK coastline, on the French coastline, is absolutely integral to ensuring that there is a, a robust barrier uh, preventing people disembarking from the French beaches in the first place. What do you reckon, so Biggins? Well, I think something has to be done, and I think this is a step forward. I mean, you know, it, it, I like her, actually. I think she's good. And I think she's good for the, for the country and for this terrible situation. I mean, 40,000 people. I mean, you know, how are we expected to cope? Mm. Mm. You know, we're, we're in a terrible financial... We can't even feed our own people. Mm. And yet these people are coming over in their drones and then they're, they're not even being allowed to live a life when they get here. They're put into these camps. I mean, it's, I don't know, there's something... Well, look, very... 80, 80 million this is set to cost us, um, another yeah. 80 million to the French. They've already had 174.8 million well, from it's 8 UK million government. a year, it's 8 million a year, um, isn't it? Well, I, I just know the total comes to 174, has okay. already been given to them, and it hasn't worked yet. It hasn't worked, they don't appear to have done much, do they? Um, but when we are actually talking about spending £7 million a day, housing migrants in hotels over here at the moment. And, as, you know, as Biggins has just said, we, we have to do something. And, you know, without the French working with us, we are not going to solve mm. the Channel Crossing problem. But it's not in their interests to solve this problem because well, they don't want is... to have all of the people that are trying to come to the UK do that. It needs to be a European-wide issue, needs to be European ride, Stephen. But, I mean, you know, everyone's struggling with issues, mm. uh, you know, with this issue in particular. No-one seems mm. to have solved the problem. Um, so, but, uh, look, it's, it's something, yeah. surely. Well, one, yeah. one really key difference in this, which is the first time it's ever happened in this deal, is having British border force officers on French soil trying to cope at some of these French centres before they, they come across to the UK, which up until now the French have said is going to impact on their sovereignty. Yes. yes. Do you think that could be the thing that... that Turns it. it has to be. I, I think that would make sense to have a processing centre. Because look, the, the bottom line here is it's not not so much about the cost, but it's about people risking their lives crossing that channel. That's what we have to stop. Mm. And so, if we have a processing centre that is humane and the conditions are good, actually on French soil with the British border force there doing that, then surely that has to be a good thing if it stops well, the boats. But are so. there gangs of people coming over too, which is another terrifying yes. thing? Yeah, yeah. You know, where they there are groups of people sending over these people yeah. to go and, and rob us and, 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 and drugging, uh, you know. Well, there's uh, a lot of concern with, Al with the... Al uh, and you've got to be careful that we don't demonise all Albanians. No, of course not. But there's a there is some issue with Albanian gangs. Yes. Which mm. is... Terrifying. Well, there is yeah. also no real reason to be seeking refuge when you come from Albania. There's no war there. No. no. Sixty percent of migrant crossings over the summer were from Albania. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, huge problem. Anyway, look, talking about pots of money, uh -huh. which is what all of this requires. Um, Dolly Parton, everyone's favourite country singer, yes, Higgins, has been given a hundred million quid by Jeff Bezos of off of Amazon. Well, I, I, I think this is wonderful. I mean, he's, this is the third time he's done it. Wow. Is give this amount of money to different... But she's has, she does so much good. Oh, yeah. Uh, and the causes that she helps... Is she one of your pals? Um, I have met her, and I got a wonderful picture with her, which I love. I mean, she is the most amazing woman. She's full of life. She's uh, a joy to be with. I think her talent is huge. And she just loves life. I mean, Dollyland. Oh, yeah. I, I want to live in yeah. Dollyland. Oh, so do I. <laughs> oh, we'll go together. Okay, perfect. <laughs> but you're right, she's so vivacious and also talented, but she's also managed to keep her private life very yes. private. I've no so, idea yeah. what her husband looks like, for example. No, and all, what he does, yeah. you know, but he keeps her happy, obviously, yeah. which is great. And she adores him. 
And, you know, she talks about him all the time, which is interesting in, in, when you get to know her. But, I mean, I think it's, it's terrific. That, I mean, that that's, must be 300 million he's given mm. to charities. I mean, I know he's the richest man, one of the richest men in the world, but, I mean, that's a really wonderful she thing to do. She does so much for charity herself, though. She, she does. For uh, children's reading in yes. America, for literature. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, she does. She, and she does it really quietly as well. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, she doesn't make a big song and dance about it like some people yeah. do when they give to charity. So, I mean, she does... And, you know, you forget how enormously talented she is. So many of the songs that she wrote that are sung by other people. Oh, Nine yeah. to five. Yeah, yeah, Dolly Parton wrote that. Oh, my God, I didn't know. Yeah. So, right. Yeah. Incredibly talented. No, I mean, she is incredibly talented. And I, I think apparently, apparently when she went up to get the money, she was genuinely shocked mm. that he'd given her £100 million. I mean, it's a lot yeah. of money. Yeah. Dude, she can do a lot with that, and she will do. Mm. I love that. I was just looking at Dolly Parton quotes... I'm a self-made woman and I have the doctor's bills to prove. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, well, exactly. We were talking about leg lengthening. She certainly improved her assets, hasn't she? Well, oh. yes. <laughs> I think that, I, that story was so extraordinary. I mean, having had my new knee put in last year, the last thing you want to do is have your knee, your leg broken and, and extended. I mean, the pain. Oh, it must pain. be. It must be very... You know, I mean... If, it, if it's a mental health issue, then it's uh, you've got to outweigh I the know, physical but... pain with the mental anguish you're going about having short legs. Tom Cruise yeah. didn't suffer that much, did he? No, he, he, was... no, he just wears high heels. Yeah. You know, <laughs> Cuban heels, Cuban heels. Well, I wonder what heels. it was about standing on his wallet that made him so attractive. <laughs> well, anyway. um, let's, can we finish off? We've got time to finish off with the times. Just quickly, Dawn, looking at diabetes, because it is World Diabetes yeah. Day. Yeah, right. Today. I was going to say, well, I, I've chosen this story because I'm obviously very aware it is World Diabetes Day and, and you are a big supporter of this, Stephen, and obviously a couple of members of my own family are now type 2 diabetic. But this is a major new trial which will screen children aged between 3 and 13 for type 1 diabetes in an attempt to pick up the disease before it actually becomes life-threatening. You'll obviously mm. know more about the condition than, than I do, Stephen, but evidently one in four are detected only when it becomes potentially fatal and they're already mm. in hospital. Were you a child when you...? Well, I was 17 when oh, I got right. type 1, but quite how they screen for it prior to that, I don't know. But well, there the... must be some technique. It'll be... Is it JDRF behind this? I wonder the charity. They do a lot of amazing work. Yes, it is JDRF and Diabetes UK, and mm. they're aiming to recruit 20,000 children for blood tests that can assess their chances of developing yeah. type 1 diabetes. No, Which is a very good, good thing to yeah. do, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Very yeah. good. No, yeah. absolutely. Look, we've got to leave it there, sadly, you two, but we'll see you in the next hour, won't we? We uh, will. Biggins and Neeson, I thank you. Thank you both. That's very informed. <laughs> this is Neeson, if you don't <laughs> mind. Yeah. Is that your married name? Yeah. Neeson. That's, it. That's nice. <laughs> right, it's 7.50. Let's bring you up to date on the latest headlines this hour. And the International Trade Secretary is to travel to Washington today to seek for UK-US cooperation on global economy and on trade rules. Kemi Badnock will call for a move towards more diverse and resilient supply chains, as well as investing in new technology to support jobs. Unite has warned the Prime Minister that the autumn statement is his last chance to save the NHS. They say the health service is on the brink of collapse and they want Rishi Sunak, even though he's not Chancellor actually at the moment, is he, uh, to avert industrial action and fix underfunding the NHS. Our reports found that young people will struggle the most to pay their bills this winter. The Resolution Foundation's intergenerational audit found younger generations are four times more likely to be on prepayment meters and less likely to have assets or savings. Now, Matt Hancock <laughs> has been in I'm a Celebrity for less than a week, but in that time, He's been made camp leader and nominated for six Bush Tucker trials in a row. And he's also been stung by a scorpion, although we've just had an email in from Paul saying, and how's the poor scorpion this morning? Uh, he's been covered in slime, he's been forced to eat animals' private parts, and he's also been attacked by a snake. But will his stint in the jungle help to salvage his reputation or is his career over? Uh, well, let's uh, talk to PR advisor Andrew Block, along with showbiz reporter Ellie Phillips, who's here in the studio. Andrew, let's start with you. I mean, he's, w he's winning the PR campaign, isn't he? I don't know. I think there's still a bit of time to go, really. I mean, it depends, ultimately, on what he's trying to achieve. If, if his future, in his mind, is getting back into the Cabinet, being a minister again, I'm not sure it's such a great move for him, but... You know, if he's looking for a platform to reach a younger generation that's perhaps disengaged with politics and hard to reach, 
then maybe it could be a good move. Well, yeah, well, yeah but to, to, to be fair, he's clearly not thinking of his, of his political career in any way, shape or form with this. He's thinking about becoming a personality, isn't he? Not really sure what he's thinking. I mean, it's, it was obviously a big decision for him and one that he won't have taken lightly. I think, ultimately, it's, it's almost like a form of rehab for him. He's looking for this opportunity for forgiveness, I think. Yeah. Well, let's bring in uh, Ellie Phillips in all of this. Hello. Lovely Hi. to see you. Um, do you think that this is working out from a PR point of view? Because I'm beginning to see a few people on social media beginning to think, fair enough, like he's been targeted from nearly all of, well, all of the trials so far. And he's taken it like a bit of a champ. He has taken it like a champ and he's thrown himself headfirst into all these trials. They haven't seemed to phase him, which is a bit annoying, to be honest. I think a lot of people are like, why is he not struggling with all of this? This is awful what he's being put through um, in terms of how difficult the trials are. I don't think it's helping him PR-wise because... When he's having chats with people, they still keep bringing up, you know, he's been made camp leader and he's dishing out rules and people are like, oh, are these, are these rules or guidelines? And people are very pointedly making, you know, comments and questioning him about things. And also people are picking up on social media when he's saying things like, oh, I fell in love and that's why I kissed my now girlfriend, you know, while everyone else had to adhere to these COVID rules. And I, I, I you know, I fessed up. People said, no, 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 you only, you know, resigned because you were caught out. So there is this narrative going alongside it where people are picking out what he's saying and actually going, mm, you're not quite on the money there but at Pic all. Pixie says, it's not Matt Han Hancock's fault he's chosen for every task. You can't deny he's doing very well. He's doing very well in the task, but I think that is separate from him doing well as a person. You know, there are constant conversations in there of, like, you know, why are you here? What are you doing this for? What are you trying to get out of it? And a lot of the celebrities in the camp aren't being fooled by what he's saying. Oh, I want people to see the real me. You know, he went in there saying... Well, that why are they doing it, though? That's what I'd be saying if I was him. Why are you here? But they are bona fide celebrities and I think that's the difference. Yeah, because Well, boy celebrity... George I've heard of. Well, yeah, but the celebrity is a famous person who is celebrated. Matt Hancock is not celebrated in any way, shape or form so he isn't what I would call a bona fide okay. celebrity. Well, let's bring in Andrew Block and all this. I mean, talking about you know, the PR and whether or not this has worked for Matt Hancock, it certainly isn't working for any of the other contestants and you'd be understandably annoyed, wouldn't you, if you were in the jungle not getting a look in for any of the Bush Tucker trials? I think, so. I think it's a bit of a challenge for the producers because, you know, love him or hate him, he's, he's good TV at the moment. Um, and they're trying to sort of balance it out. You can see that they're getting him to do tasks with other people and not let him take the spotlight completely. I, I think really it's going to come down to how he's perceived on the show. And it's still pretty early days in terms of, of the jungle. And, you know, when you go on these types of shows, you have to be yourself. You can't be anything else. So... He is coming across as an OK person, um, I think, so far. Perhaps it's just a little bit too soon and the country and the campmates aren't quite ready to forgive and forget just yet. Um, and to me, that's, that's the biggest issue. Is it just a sort of big ego trip for him and a quick fix that just can't be fixed in such a short space of time? I sort of don't care what the other campmates think. Got to be honest. Um, but we've got to leave it there, sadly. Thank you both very much <laughs> indeed. Good to see you. Let us know your thoughts at home if you are a big uh, fan of the show. Has it been hijacked by the Hancock Circus or are you it's loving not, it? Or? It's not him, though, is it? This is what I don't understand. It's not him. It's the it's people, the, voting. It's people voting and the producers, mm. how they edit it all. They're there you know, every 24 hours. They cut it down to, what, an hour? Well, Melanie says, I wouldn't blame the participants if they quit the show for not being chosen to participate. They're not getting a look in. Yeah, they're sitting there making money by doing nothing. What's Simone about? Why would they quit? Sit there ro raking the cash. <laughs> but, I mean, hey, what's wrong with these people? <laughs> uh, we've got more coming up for you in just a couple of minutes. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee. But we'll also have some fun along the way.
That's GB News headliners at 11 p.m. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11 p.m., seven nights a week. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. There's never been a more interesting but also critical time in British politics. And I can't wait to bring you the biggest stories of the day with the best factual accuracy and also a few of my own opinions thrown in. We'll engage in passionate but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Monday to Thursday, 10 till 12 on TV, on radio and online. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deems & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Home Secretary has signed a new agreement with France to tackle illegal crossings. Good morning to you. It's Monday the 14th of November. This is Breakfast on GB News with Isabel and Stephen. Here's what's leading the news this morning. The Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, has signed a new pact <coughs> with France to try and stem the flow of migrants crossing the Channel. It comes as the number of people making the journey has passed 40,000. The Chancellor has warned that everyone's going to have to pay more tax under his economic plans, which will be published on Thursday. He's reportedly looking to raise £20 billion more in taxes. He feels betrayed by the club. Cristiano Ronaldo speaks out about his experience at Manchester United as he claims manager Eric Ten Hag is trying to force him out. And King Charles is 74 today. It's going to be marked by a rendition of Happy Birthday, played by the Household Cavalry, and gun salutes right across London. And as always, we love to hear from you. We are the People's Channel. Send us your thoughts on any of the topics we're covering. You can tweet us or send us an email. Well, the Home Secretary has been meeting with the French Interior Minister to finalise a new agreement on tackling illegal crossings. It is expected to include a 40% increase in the number of officers patrolling beaches in northern France, as well as investment in port security to try to prevent illegal entry. Now, UK officers will work together with French officers for the first time, sharing information to try to understand what's going on. There will also be a focus on technology and more investment in removal centres. Well, the Home Secretary has been talking and in the last few minutes we've been hearing from her. Let's have a listen to what she has to say. There are several elements to the deal and I think it represents a positive next step to our collaboration 
with the French. It's not going to fix it overnight, it's not a silver bullet, but I think for the first time we have some real wins for both the French and the UK. First of all, we'll see embedded observers. That means there will be British officers working on French soil, observing the work or working on the ground with French officers to uh, detect and intercept the illegal migrants as they attempt to leave France. Uh, we'll be working hand in hand in the control rooms, uh, you know, managing intelligence and working to, uh, with law enforcement bodies. There'll be a 40% uplift in the number of French gendarmes patrolling the French beaches. And there'll be stronger and closer collaboration when it comes to criminal law enforcement intelligence collaboration and uh, interception upstream so that the organised immigration criminal gangs can further be disrupted and dismantled. Well, let's talk to the director for Migrant Voice, Nazik Ramadan, who's here in the studio. It's lovely to see you this morning. Can I ask what you think of, of all of this? I mean, the fact that the Home Secretary is talking about trying to intercept criminal gangs, prevent illegal migration into the UK, and this is clearly a step in the right direction as far as she's concerned. Do you accept that something does need to be done to, to stop what we're seeing at the moment? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, we've been calling for legal routes to end, to put an end to uh, people needing to travel illegally and risk their lives in order to save them. And it's about time they did something. Uh, and just we need to maybe to put things in context. Uh, we've been hearing a lot about migration in the news. Just to say that UK rates number 18 amongst European countries per the number of people they receive, asylum seekers who come to the UK. And also France takes more, three times more people than the UK, uh, than, uh, you know, in asylum applications. Uh, so does Germany and Greece and others. So UK is not the number one destination. And UK only hosts 1% of the world's refugees. So it's important to put this in context. But also, we're talking about legal crossing, just to remember that more than two thirds of those people who are coming, crossing in the, through the channels, are being given asylum uh, on the first application, first attempt. So we are dealing with people who are but, but, fleeing with, persecution with, and wars and who need our protection. With, with respect, though, those figures in relation to how many are given asylum are backdated because we know it takes at least a year now to go through these applications. And just this summer alone, 60% of those crossing were from Albania, where there is no reason to be seeking refuge here in the UK. And so there is a problem, is there not, with people who are actually economic migrants migrants coming here and being put up at vast expense for the taxpayer, millions of pounds per day, in hotels, when quite frankly they could be earning a living in their own country? Yeah, I mean, there are two issues here. I think the Albanian situation is a little bit different, but... Uh, but it's 90 a huge part of, of the Albanian you can't women, separate that out of it, yeah, can you? Yeah, 90% of the Albanian women and children who come are granted asylum, just to be clear. But this is about if people want to come work. There are no legal works, legal routes for people to come. But uh, pe putting people in hotels, why are we putting pe people in hotels for too long? Why can we not process applications faster? Uh, and why not allow people to work? Uh, my organization works with people who have been in waiting for decision for many, many years, and they are feeling destroyed as human beings because they can work, they can rely on themselves, they are forced to live in poverty. I mean, people, we are hearing about people in hotels. I'm hearing of people, 10 people in a room and three rooms sharing one toilet, uh, and people haven't showered on an another floor, and mm. people haven't to live on horrible food and eight pounds per week to pay for travel, for telephones, for shampoo, for hygiene stuff. I mean, people are forced and are struggling. So, but and do, do they look at that? I mean, and, and that's an awful situation. Or from a human perspective, that's an awful situation. Let's make no, no bones about it. However, do those people then end up thinking, well, I wish I hadn't come? I mean, you know, most people wish they never made that journey. The first thing, when you ask someone, what do you tell others after you cross that channel and say, you know, don't make it? Mm. People are forced to make this journey. No one would, you know, risk their lives and sit on, on, on that boat and, uh, and well, like, well, be prepared to that unless, forgive they, you know... Me, but, uh, for the, but apart from the fact they're making that journey, because it's, it's the channel crossings that we're focusing on, yes. they're, they're making that journey from a safe country. France is a safe country. Well, if you have connections to the UK, if you're, all your family is in the UK, if your parents are in the UK, if, you know, this is why you want to come to the UK. And as I said earlier, France already takes three, as 
three times as many people as as UK. So not everyone coming to UK. Actually, smaller number of people. And we, I mean, we're saying lots of people come through the channel crossing just because all other routes have closed. Well, except you say that, and you know, I think the big problem with this is that we're conflating into this people who are economic migrants with people who are genuinely seeking asylum and and are actually fleeing a dangerous country like Syria. When you're talking about economic migrants, of course, there are legal routes. You can get a working visa if you're a nurse or a doctor. I think we issue something like eight thousand five hundred visas in this country per week. So there are legal routes into the country and valuable roles to be taken up. Well, I mean, again, as I said, the situation with the Albanians is very new. It's only this year we've seen that increase and a separate story and shouldn't be conflated with those who are here for fleeing for their lives. And there's only one way to find out if people, you know, are in, uh, fleeing safety is to assess them, is to process them, is to talk to them. You can't just brand people as illegal if you don't know, if you haven't even mm. uh, listened to them. And I hope, uh, you know, from today's uh, agreement, that there is a practical solution. And for once, the UK government is not only spending money on security and building more fences and walls in the face of desperate people who need our protection and who have the rights under international law to seek our protection, regardless of the way they choose to travel. I hope this time there's something process, you know, practical. We've been asking the government, to, why don't you have uh, processing center in Calais. Yeah, if well, you don't exactly. want people to make this, uh, this crossing, process them there, have a center, meet them there, talk to them, assess them, and then allow them to travel legally. But there are no legal routes. Uh, UK, to claim asylum in UK, you must be yes, on UK soil. And all yeah. those legal routes have been closed. There are a small number of legal routes, but they're very restrictive mm. and very small indeed. Mm. OK. Nazit, really good to talk to you Thank this you morning. very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for having me. No, I mean, it's interesting. There's been a lot of people said about having, you know, that pro doing the processing mm in France, mm. which makes a lot of sense. Mm. The problem is, of course, the French haven't wanted us to do that. Mm. But maybe this changes with all of this. Yeah. And look, as I, as I said during that interview, I think the big tragedy of all of this is that we conflate the two things and we lose all sympathy for everybody involved. But we are an incredibly wealthy country compared to most in the world. Mm. And therefore, we do have a duty to take in people when they are fleeing persecution, whatever it may be. We just don't want to be taken advantage of, do we? No, but it's, it's getting that balance right, isn't Absolutely. it? So maybe this is a step in the right direction. Well, yes, I mean, we need more detail. Thoughts. We need to see how it's going to work in practice, don't we? Now, Let us know what you think. In other news this morning, the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, has warned that everyone is going to have to pay more taxes <laughs> as he prepares to unveil his long-awaited autumn statement, which will happen on Thursday. Yeah, now he's reportedly preparing a package that's going to see 20 billion in tax rises and 35 billion in spending cuts. Yesterday he said that although that's going to disappoint people, he is going to protect the most vulnerable. Well, joining us now for more is the diary editor at The Spectator, James Heal. A very warm welcome to you. Oh, my goodness, the wincing when we say £35 billion in spending cuts. I mean, it's not just austerity, it's austerity on steroids because of the state of our public services as they stand today compared to last time. Of course, and you look at the last decade as well, we had uh, that austerity period between about 2010 and 2016. And in the last five years or so, we've seen the uh, pressures of COVID on the UK economy, uh, as well as very limited growth as well. So um, we're now having to find spending cuts on top of uh, everything that's come before it. And frankly, there's not much stuff left uh, to cut. So that's why there's a mix of spending cuts and tax rises as well. Well, in terms of those spending cuts, though, there is still plenty of flab on the system, isn't there, when it comes to things like civil servants? Well, it depends how much, you know, you're adding all this stuff up, how much is it actually going to bring in, you know, talking £35 billion pounds worth. Um, I mean, I look forward to... The, the danger is, of course, how can you have efficiencies and pub decent public services while also keeping that balance right? Mm. Yeah, and I suppose the other big problem is how you avoid making the problem worse. We know we're heading into recession. Mm. We know we have a problem with growth. Normally, if you're facing these sorts of problems, you don't go and cut taxes and cut uh, raise taxes yeah. and cut spending. Yes, quite. And I think what's really interesting is that I think although Liz Truss got a lot of stuff wrong with the mini budget, it's so absent at the time from the conversation is growth. There's no one talking about growth because we're all talking about the short to medium term of the next six months or so, uh, how we can get through to the other side. And there's a lot of talk about what the markets want, but in terms of the next two years until the next election, no one's talking about growth and how we're going to no, improve the economy. No, but, but isn't it interesting because it's all about well, how do we stimulate growth mm. as a conversation compared to how how do we reduce inflation? And the two are basically yeah. opposites, yeah. Well, aren't they? Yeah, well, this shows the difficult bind that the government's in, really. And um, how do you try and 
get those both balanced right while also kind of keeping an eye on the election uh, and the prospects coming up because in the Conservative Party as well there's some people who want lower taxes, there's other who want um, higher spending mm. in places. I mean, to be brutal about it, we need to forget about the election, don't we? Well, I mean, you know, they're politicians, yeah. they've got self-survival. Well, it's it's well, game over, you but reckon? In, ter in terms of what... Well, I'm not saying that it's right. game over. What I'm saying is from in terms of, of the benefit to the mm. country... The election should be the last thing yes. in anyone's mind. A fair point, but there's also an element of party management, right? If the government yeah. can't get their budget through Parliament and there's people rebelling about it, that's also going to spook the market as well, mm. causing borrowing premiums to go up. Mm. How have approval, approval ratings changed since mm. we've seen... What some have described them as the, a pair of doom mongers. Other people have seen them as the grown-ups coming back mm. into Downing Street. I mean, they were at record low for the Conservatives under, under the Trust administration for all it's the improved. reasons that we've covered. Yeah. How, how's it doing? Well, uh, Rishi Sunak is, is seen as still as more popular prime minister, popular leader, I should say, than Keir Starmer. Um, but even his ratings have taken a hit over the last fortnight or so, as we've seen more of this, you know, economic measures coming through. Um, but the Labour Party is still well ahead in the party, the polls and the Conservatives. But, you see, what, but what is clear from that is that it's not the Labour Party's... It's just because the Labour Party's keeping quiet, mm. isn't it? It's not anything they're doing. Because amidst all of this, and of course they'll be critical come Thursday when all of this is discussed in the House... But what could they do that was any, that is any different or substantially different after the policies that the, 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 the Chancellor's got and nicked yeah. from Labour anyway? I think when we saw the last mini-budget, you know, just, what was it, two months ago or less than that, um, you know, Labour actually didn't criticise that many of the measures involved. I think they, they criticised the top rate tax and that was basically it. Um, and that's, I think, Rachel Reeves' masterstroke has been to say nothing and just let the whole thing mm. fall apart. But as you say, what would Labour do differently? They don't hear much about that. Mm. No. Um, we've been told there will be some good news mm. in Thursday's budget. Um, often and comes, what's the phrase, a rabbit out of the hat. I mean, what can we hope for in terms of some light in all of this? Well, I think, obviously, the Treasury, there's always a sort of PR push on these things to try and you know, get the messaging right and then doom and gloom when you think, actually, it's not going to be Armageddon. Um, I think in terms of some of the tax rises that have been mooted, we won't see those going ahead. Um, some areas be more protected in terms of spending cuts. Um, but, I mean, Jeremy Hunt literally said yesterday that there are going to be no rabbits or anything like that in a the triple lock, Sunday though. Times. Yeah, the triple lock will be, I mean, that's keeping, this is the danger of like, trying to keep which manifesto pledges. You know, you're trying to keep the pledge of no new tax increases while also keeping the triple lock. So I think that will be the hope in some areas and maybe some look about what energy price guarantee will look like. I mean, it's, it's interesting because he said he you know, will protect the most vulnerable, mm. which presumably by which he means people on benefits and pensioners, which is the whole, just the triple lock argument. It's 11 billion quid, though. It's a lot of money. If it is, but then also, you know, you're, you're going into this period of economic downturn and, of course, we've seen a, you know, a squeeze on benefits over the last decade as well. So the danger is, you know, who do you try to keep happy? And I think the danger for the Conservatives is that it's going to be people who are on you know, middle-income, uh, middle-class salaries who are going to be very badly hit by this in terms of the fiscal drag. Mm. Just a final word. I know that the Prime Minister will be flying back, a 17-hour flight back yep. from the Philippines, arriving 6am on Thursday morning ahead of, of this statement on Thursday. But what can we expect from the G20 in the meantime? which is taking place in Bali over the next few days. A lot of tension. This is probably going to be the most tense G20 since it was started in 1999, and Russia and China are going to dominate those issues on Taiwan and uh, the Ukraine crisis as well. So he's going to be out of the frying pan into the fire for... Yeah. But, but, uh, back, it's the opportunity for backdoor negotiations, isn't it? It is, but equally they're not expecting a communique, which would be you know, a real sign of how relations have deteriorated. And they normally have this group photo at the end of the day where they all you know, stand up together, uh, but no-one wants to be photographed with the Russians this time, so that's unlikely to go ahead. Oh. James, good to see you. Thank you, Thank you very you. much indeed. Uh, it is 16 minutes past eight. Let's bring you up to date with some of the headlines then. And the UK and France have signed a historic agreement worth £63 million to tackle the migrant crisis. It's aimed at stopping people illegally crossing the Channel. It includes a boost to beach patrols and British staff in French control rooms for the very first time. It's a small boat arrivals topped 40,000 so far this year. We take a multi uh, dimensional approach. There's no single answer, there's no quick fix, there's no silver bullet. Uh, our cooperation and collaboration with the French on the Channel, uh, on the UK coastline, on the French coastline is absolutely integral to ensuring that there is a, a robust barrier uh, preventing people disembarking from the French beaches in the first place. The International Trade Secretary will travel to Washington today to seek for UK-US cooperation on global economy and trade rules. Kemi Badnock will call for a move towards more diverse and resilient supply chains as well as investing in new technology to support jobs. 
Now, the union Unite is warning number 10. The autumn statement is the last chance to save the NHS. They say it's on the brink of collapse and they want Rishi Sunak and the Chancellor to act to avert industrial action and fix underfunding. I mean, they may as well bang their heads against a brick wall, yeah. Unite, in all of that, really. I sort of think... Last chance to save the NHS, we've heard it all before, to be perfectly honest. And, to, and the money side of it all, we've already had the health secretary oh, no. saying he's not, he doesn't want to negotiate on salaries. Mm. I mean, they're asking for 15%, I think it actually is now. He said that's unrealistic, isn't going to happen. But it's a starting point. Mm. I mean, they're playing hardball on it, but Unite laying in like that isn't going to change yeah, anything. Mm. I don't know. So, I, I mean, I know it's all, it's all PR. I know they're trying to raise the issue... But it's all just PR. Yeah, but also loses public support, doesn't it, sometimes? Uh, let us know your thoughts on all of the things we're talking about this morning, uh, including His Majesty King Charles III's birthday. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, sir. 74 years young, and gun salutes will be fired right across the capital in honour of the occasion. Now, he will mark the day privately after, of course, a very busy period following the death of Queen Elizabeth in September. Well, let's speak to the Royal Reporter, Cameron Walker, who's live from Buckingham Palace now for us. Good morning to you, Cameron. Uh, we've seen lots of the royals over the weekend, but it will be a private celebration today. Good morning, Isabel. Yes, as we understand it, that is correct. But it was on this day in 1948 that Buckingham Palace released this very short statement, which I think I'm just going to repeat to you. It said the Princess Elizabeth, Duchess of Edinburgh, was safely delivered of a prince at 9.14 p.m. today. Her Royal Highness and her son are both doing well. Well, 74 years later, that little baby is now King Charles III. And yesterday, he led the nation in honouring our war dead. Now, as we understand it, as you just said, Isabel, there are no public engagements today. He is expected to mark the day privately. He's currently not in London. We know that because the Royal Standard is not flying above Buckingham Palace. It's the Union flag, which means he's not here or at Clarence House. That could change, of course. Um, but what we do know is happening today is the Band of the Household Cavalry will be performing Happy Birthday during the traditional changing of the guard ceremony at Buckingham Palace. That kicks off at about 10.45 a.m. this morning. Then the King's Troop Royal Horse Artillery, who we saw fire the guns uh, yesterday during the Remembrance Sunday service, will fire 41 volleys in London's Green Park, just to the north side of Buckingham Palace. Uh, and the bands of the Scots Guards will perform Happy Birthday immediately afterwards inside Green Park as well. Then an hour later, at the Tower of London, big famous Royal Fortress, the Honourable, Honourable Artillery Company will fire a 62-gun salute at the Tower of London. Now, we know that the late Queen had two birthdays, her actual birthday in April, as well as an official one in June, which coincided with Trooping the Colour Ceremony, as well as the Queen's birthday honours list. It's been a tradition since the 1700s actually that any monarch whose birthday didn't naturally fall in the summer months would get a second birthday. Now there's been no confirmation yet as to whether King Charles intends to do the same thing and keep with tradition but one tradition perhaps he's perhaps more likely to, uh, 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 to confirm is during foreign tours when he was Prince of Wales, he was known when it fell on his birthday to celebrate with a birthday cake. So perhaps he'll be doing that today. Ah, oh, let's hope so. Cameron, thank you very much indeed. I hope you get invited in for a slice. Perhaps the Queen Consort baked it herself. She's a good baker, isn't she? Yeah. She likes a bit of baking. Yeah. Well, maybe the grandchildren, maybe the grandchildren have made a little cake for, for Grandpapa. <laughs> oh, I be, love to imagine would, what goes on. That would be on. less exciting, <laughs> wouldn't it? That would <laughs> be, be a, bit, a bit of a mess. <laughs> would be very imagine, much still. done with love. Happy uh, birthday, Yes. Sir. After the break, Kate Hardcastle will be here. She's going to be talking about the potential dangers of buy now, pay later services, things like Klarna. Find out more after this. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. 
Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Co. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubri, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Co. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. Hello, I'm Esther Akvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Hello, I'm Alastair Stewart and I'd invite you to join me at noon on Saturdays and Sundays for Alastair Stewart and Friends. I've been in this business for over 40 years. Now, here at GB News, I've never been happier. I get to choose the big stories that really interest me. We hear what you have to say, and you hear what I have to say. I really hope you can join me noon on Saturdays and Sundays. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. <laughs> Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. picking up you or me but it seems it's me it's uh, 8 25 still to come on the program this morning over to you thank you very much <laughs> at 8 45 we're going to talk to a man who's in the middle of a challenge to run 465 kilometers in a month he's raising money for movember and men's mental health wow that is incredible i salute him um, after nine we've got the foreign secretary james cleverly this is as the uk signs this uh, landmark deal on migration with france remember you can join in all of our discussions let us know your thoughts this morning on email or on twitter Now, soaring costs, soaring cost of living, Christmas presents have to be bought, though, don't we? So, how tempted are you to use things like buy ba 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 I'm turning into with the two Ronnies. Buy now, pay later services. Uh, but charities and experts are warning that you could end up in debt. Yes, well, millions across England utilise interest-free payment options, but experts say they come with risks and many are unregulated, meaning there's less protection than paying actually with a credit card. Oh, let's talk to our very favourite expert on these sort of things, Kate Hardcastle. Good morning. Morning, chaps. Look, you can see the, the attraction of buy now, pay later, but it's the pay later bit we've got to remember, isn't it? I really can. And, and I think 
I'm actually more concerned about the next few weeks than any time at all. We've got percentage figures coming out every week saying people are really worried about the spend for Christmas. They don't want to cut back. They've got things to buy. The main money is going towards those bills that are soaring, the cost of food, the cost of fuel. So this looks like a quick alternative. And the thing is, where did BNPL come from by now, pay later? It came from understanding a lot of the time that a lot of what we call cart abandonment. So when you buy something online, mm. put it in the basket and then don't go through the purchase, is because people get frustrated with typing in their address details, typing in the credit card details. And what these organisations often do is they take the pain out of it. It's mm. so easy to use them. And we're talking about brands like Klarna and PayPal Credit here. And so you tip in your details, it's all quick and easy. And before you know it, you've opted into what is short-term credit. And that's where the concern is. What exactly are you using this for? And what might be the repercussions if you don't use it wisely? But, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It's all about using it wisely because for many people, it's just about spreading the cost, which actually is quite a sensible thing to do rather than front-loading it all as you head into the most expensive time of year during the coldest months of the year when you're paying all your expensive bills. You're completely right, Isabel. It's about discipline. You know, these are brilliant facilities to use as well. If you're buying things like clothing, you're not sure on the size mm. and you can return it and it doesn't even hit or dent your credit card. It's because they, a lot of them enable a return facility where you can freeze the payment, get it sent back, and then it's done. That's great. It's when you suddenly need to start borrowing to pay off this or you really struggle to pay off it because there are late fees. Mm. There are debt collectors that will come to your door if, if these right. things escalate. This is really concerning territory, so it's knowing what it's about. I hate to sound like a really dull, boring northerner, but I'm a dull, boring northerner. I like Right. Yes. If you haven't got the money, mm. don't spend it. You know, we always used to say, didn't you, if you have to ask the price, you can't afford it. And mm. I think there's that kind of mentality that if this time of year you're thinking of using something because the funds aren't there, when will the funds be there? Are you using it like Isabel suggested? I'm just being savvy with my money, I'm mm. spreading the cost a little bit, I'm taking some of the pressure off. Or realistically, are you using it because it's just not there? And I think that's where you have to start at that payment yeah. checkout. But I don't think enough attention's paid to the fact that it is because they're so easy to use. And I think you've got to pull yourself back from that. One of the things I do is I don't let my computer on my phone save any credit card or debit card information. That means I've got to painstakingly put it in each time. And that means I'm thinking twice about the purchase I'm making before I make it. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, do you know what? Go on. I have to say, it, it, just, it reminds <laughs> me of growing up. We had no money growing up as a family. Um, but we never... I always remember my parents saying, Dad was made redundant at one stage and all the rest of it. So we didn't spend money we didn't have. Mm. We always, As kids, we still had a nice Christmas. We didn't know any different. Mm. And the kids aren't going to notice the same, are they? The Parents worry on. more than the kids. I mean, we, we saw last week with the advertising from John Lewis through to Marks and Spencers, there's a lot of pressure off in terms of the big push. But there's always going to be those conversations in the schoolyard. There's always going to be those conversations about the wreath on the door or mm. how nice your Christmas tree looks on Instagram. The pressure is there. And it's about trying to say, look, I have to do this differently because I don't want the hangover, the financial hangover, into next year. Mm. And just lastly, we introduced the whole segment talking about how credit cards are actually often much safer. Just explain why that might be a better approach for people than perhaps a BNPN. Yes, BNPL, by now, yep. pay later, are not regulated. They also don't offer their Section 75. And Section 75 is basically a clause within a credit card use that means you are extra, have extra protection around some purchases. That doesn't mean, I am not saying go out and use right, a credit card right. instead. I'm just saying for certain purchases, if you're going to put them on credit anyway and you can control that credit, it's often a good idea to have that extra security, particularly on travel, electrical insurances and things like that. Yeah, it's a little so extra level A little of bit insurance. of extra insurance, yeah. But of course, if you don't pay your credit card off, then you will pay interest on so it. So the rule of thumb is, if you don't and can't feel you can pay off by now, pay later, please don't get into it to start with. Yeah. yeah. Top tips. Kate, thank, thank you, you very much. It's common sense, isn't it? And I know it's a bit harsh to say if you can't, if you haven't got the money, don't spend it. But that's the reality. No, but what isn't do you, it? you know, people have multiple children, people have multiple godchildren, they have nieces and nephews. You just have to go token. I and mean, we were doing that as a family this year. We're doing token presents mm. because everyone's just not wanting to save money. It's a great call, our secret mm. Santa. Just for yeah. one year, have that realistic mm. conversation, take the pressure off. It's about fam Christmas, is about family. Mm. and about spending time together, not about spending shed loads of money. There you go. That's the reality yeah. of it. Oh, you're both so wise. <laughs> well, honestly... <laughs> I haven't though. got it cracked. I haven't got it cracked. But that, I've said it before, I've got seven uh, godchildren, two children of my own, nieces and nephews, and I can't say to them, sorry, guys, 
you know, cost of living crisis, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a secret Santa. Each of them are individually, my godchildren. Buy them a box of chocolates each or something. Yeah, I won't go crazy, you know, but, but I still spend... feel the pressure. That's like ten kids to, to sort yeah, out. Yeah, and there's just... some great products raising money for charities this year as well. Nice I'm gonna idea. cover those in a few weeks with you guys, so we can have a look at doing <gasps> yes. good while spending. Oh, now yeah, that's up okay. my street. Let's like, that. Excellent. Yeah. Right. And she still spends it. She's happy. <laughs> no, <laughs> not at all. Line. That's not at all the bottom line. Don't mm. twist that. Uh, look, coming up for you in a couple of minutes, Dawn Neeson and Christopher Biggins are back as we take you through the papers. Excellent. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. And Dan Wooten, join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews, and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship, and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Every Friday and Sunday night from nine, it's Mark Dolan tonight. We're on the same page again. Great, There's something great, great happening. Let him well, finish. Don't be such a cranky. <laughs> <laughs> that mini budget was the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> and on Saturday, my show just got bigger. From eight, it's Mark Dolan's Saturday Night In. You can't govern a country if you can't speak. <laughs> Stop talking. My God, we reached the end. I've never been early in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Only on GB News, the People's Channel. Join me, Arlene Foster, for the briefing on GB News. Every Friday at 3 p.m., I'll give you all the latest political news and analysis, and we'll have a robust live debate. To make sure that you're caught up on all of the biggest issues of the day, we'll bring on experts in their field. I'll ask the questions that you'd like to ask. We're not afraid to tackle discussions from all perspectives, including yours. Don't forget the briefing with me, Arlene Foster, every Friday at 3 p.m. on GB News. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing. You see, amazing. You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. It's 8.36. Very good morning to you. Let's bring you up to date with the key stories today. And the UK and France have signed a historic agreement worth £63 million to tackle the migrant crisis. It's meant to stop people illegally crossing the English Channel and includes a boost to beach patrols and British staff in French control rooms for the first time. It's as small boat arrivals topped 40,000 so far this year. We take a multi uh, dimensional approach. There's no single answer, there's no quick fix, there's no silver bullet. Uh, our cooperation and collaboration with the French 
on the channel, uh, on the UK coastline, on the French coastline, is absolutely integral to ensuring that there is a, a robust barrier uh, preventing people disembarking from the French beaches in the first place. The Prime Minister has vowed to deliver on market expectations in this week's autumn budget. Rishi Sunak says the Chancellor will unveil measures to put our public finances on a sustainable trajectory. It's after Jeremy Hunt warned that everyone will need to pay a little bit extra in tax. The surveys found more than a quarter of football fan, fans are anxious about how much they might lose betting during the World Cup. Well, don't do it then. Gamble Aware has found six in ten say there are too many gambling adverts during international tournaments. It's, it's, oh, it's easy to say that it's a huge addiction problem. Well, it is though, an addiction, it? but they're, you know. But if you, if you just how many football fans it was saying, well, well, we think we're going to lose too much money. Well, don't put it on then. Well, easily said. Oh. Easily, easily Fools said. game is gambling. Yes, Fools Dad. game. <laughs> no, it is. It is. House always wins and all that. Well, absolutely. Yeah. Talking about getting your knickers in a twist. <laughs> here you go. Dawn Neeson and Biggins are here. Good morning, you two. Good morning. We're going to start with migrants in the Telegraph. Am I going to start a rant now? I was just going to. I was just going to tell you what Biggins said to uh, oh. uh, <laughs> to Isabella. She went to the loo during the break. Oh I'm gosh. Not allowed. No. <laughs> Decency. Oh, I don't know. About Decency that. prevents. It me. was very excited. She ran past us. <laughs> oh, God, How did you get in a two-minute advert break? Yes, yeah, so you, you, yeah. you do it beautifully, by the oh, way. Yeah. Can I just say I'm not in. Instilled with this migrant issue, right? Right, right, sorry. Well, I, I, I want to feel confident about it, and I think there's got to be a step in the right direction. What bothers me slightly, I know it's being a bit pedantic, is Suella Braverman saying it's, she wants to stop people disembarking from the French coasts. Well, that's not English. Well, it's embarking from the French coast and disembarking in England. Now, if she's not getting that right, what else is she not getting right? It's a bit basic. It's a bit pedantic, though. Oh, you're, my God, English, you're a pedantic though. dad today, aren't you? Don't you think that's important? <laughs> not disembarking. If they were disembarking in France, we wouldn't be bothered. No, we? you're right. You're right. She's, uh, perhaps she didn't think about it. As you have, Stephen. Well, well, maybe. Right, in any case, so, <laughs> Isabel, shall we continue yeah. with the paper? <laughs> Back to the Telegraph. Um, and they have sent a, um, a reporter out to the French coast, to Dunkirk, to see how it is actually happening and how this new plan is going to work. I mean... Last year, the French so far stopped 29,000 migrants crossing. That's only 42% of the total. And this new plan that Suella has announced somewhat um, incorrectly yes. this morning um, is hoping to stop 80% by putting more people. It's 18 and a half miles of French coast patrol. And the French always say, we don't have enough people to do it. That's the main problem. Mm -hmm. So the money we are giving them today will, in theory, put more gendarmes on the beaches to stop the boats Embarking, disembarking, leaving the French coast. Leaving Steve, the French how's coast, that? Yes. Leaving the French coast. Leaving the French coast. So, I mean, but what they are, this report is that what they are already doing is that the simple solution to this is most of these are rubber dinghies. The simple solution is just go and puncture the rubber dinghies before they actually leave the beach. That is a simple solution. It's not more complicated than that. Then the boats can't set off. It will stop, hopefully, stop the trade. Um, you know, because if the, if the boats can't leave, the trade doesn't happen. So stop the slave trading, which is basically what we're talking about, um, and, and hopefully solve the problem. So it has to be a good thing. Now, whether the French stick to their part of the deal is another matter. And this Well, is... if they're being paid for it, they better add. Well, we've already paid them quite a bit, though, haven't we? And I always... The, the problem with this is, like, they could spot... Remember when we had the trawler wars? They could spot one British oh. trawler in the wrong bit of their water, but they can't spot 40,000 migrants <laughs> leaving yeah. their beaches. Odd, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> this is the thing. I mean, what do you think about this announcement then today? Another... Well, I thought it was 80 million, but we were just reading out something like 63 million, but we've already paid 174 million to yeah. the French. It just feels like we're shedding out cash and... Uh, 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 for what? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's a lot of money which could be going to help the people in our country. You know, we're, we're facing a crisis of lack of money, people... And, you know, you know I, I, I'm, I fully have agreement with the tax thing that we're going to have on Thursday, I think it is. Uh, but, I, you know, I think that we should be helping the less fortunate. You know, there are people who are, are, are saying, 
heating or heating. And this is the problem I think a lot of us have, is obviously, you know, once these people are over here, we, we have to do something to, to care for them. But putting them up in, in hotels at a cost of seven million a day, while we've got people in this country who are sitting freezing in their own homes... Absolutely. ..and can't afford to buy hot meals... Yeah. There, ..there's a, a problem mm. there. And as I was saying earlier on, I, I spent Remembrance Sunday at a service in Folkestone in Kent, which is the base for the Gurkhas. And I was sort of, like, watching the Gurkhas leading the parade, and they walked past one of the hotels that are being used to house migrants, and there were lots of young, fit men sitting around outside this hotel watching the Remembrance Parade go past. Now, remember, our government fought tooth and nail to stop Gurkhas getting pension rights, the right to settle here, when they actually fought for this country. Mm. And now they are happy... don't seem happy, but, I mean, we are paying to put young, fit men who are entering the country illegally... Yeah. They're not illegal, the way they're doing it is yeah. illegal... Putting them up in hotels. None of this makes sense. It's, no, it's, it the, it's the abuse of the asylum system. Yes, exactly. And, and, I, and the fact that they are now being lumped in with people like those fleeing yeah. Ukraine or Syria who genuinely have a risk to life and there is a duty to share that responsibility yes. and if they have British connections, fine. I don't think many people would object no, to that. No, of course not, Isabel. And but it just... it's when you've got these, as you say, perfectly fit young men coming from a country where they could find employment abusing the system and, and going to, in some cases, stately homes. Yes. Hotels costing two hundred. Some of them are really nice, aren't, aren't they? they? Mm. Well, that'd be nice. It's, it's wrong. I'd it's like all wrong. It's all wrong. It costs two hundred pounds a night. Um, what's this in the Times about a coffin club? Well, I've never heard of this, but I think it's quite interesting. It's a coffin club, and they meet, uh, they have meetings, and I'm interested to see that ac the actress Miriam Margulies, who's a friend of mine, is a patron. Really? So, how would you like to be buried? Oh, I don't... Well, how, how would do you... you like when I'm think, dead would I'd be a like star. Dead would be a... <laughs> with people. I don't really care what my coffin is like, but I'd like to be with my husband when I die. I don't want to be on my... You mean you want him to die, to die with you? Oh, well, he can die. Oh, I don't... First is what she's saying. I don't know. Uh, I'm scared to go on my own, so I'd rather I went to join him, yeah. Stephen, anyway. what would you... How would you like? Would you like music or any particular music or a particular shape <laughs> coffin or... Uh... <laughs> Because <laughs> this is what you can have on this right, club. So you can choose your... Well, I wouldn't mind a TARDIS coffin. A TARDIS? So you'd yes. stand up, would you? No, no, wait, I'd have to lie, I'd have to lie down. In... <laughs> be a very what sort of coffin do you... Well, let's well, see what Dawn would like yeah. for her coffin. I would like something... We, we had this conversation at the weekend, which is really weird. I want the full Victorian Gothic splendour. Oh, like a I mausoleum. Want black, I want mausoleums, I want black horse-drawn carriages with oh. horses with black plumes. plumes. The husband's terrified by this. He's just going to bump me off and do it quietly. Because he's going to. He's going to. Yeah, yeah. we well, just shove me in the Thames because we live no, by the river. No. So, yeah, but I, I want the full begins? work. Sorry. I can imagine you with sort of some panto. <laughs> yeah, I, a, quite, a pink, I think. A pink coffin would be lovely. And I love actually, I love these uh, raffia ones. Oh, they're beautiful. They're beautiful. I think I would definitely have one of those. I definitely want the Laughing Policeman song <laughs> yeah. being played as I, I, as I go into the... Uh, well, what you've got to have is the vicar standing there saying, Biggins is dead, and everyone has to shout back, Oh, no, it's not! <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, perfect. Oh, perfect. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I do. I do sort of think. I mean, funerals are, can be a very, very sad time, of course. But I sort of think it's quite. If you can choose your own coffin, if you can make it a bit about yeah, yeah. you rather than someone else, then picking it after after you've popped. Absolutely. The I think it's good to organise. Try and organise yeah. as much as you can of your funeral. I really do. I know because... where I'm being buried. Do you? Yeah, I've got the plots all sorted. Yeah. Uh, is it a public plot or is it yeah. a? No. Yeah. 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 In it's Lytham. Shep I'll be in Lytham. Lytham? Mm. Is that your hometown? Is that no, you're... it's not. It's where my husband's from, though, and where his brother's buried and also all be... There. So you're going to be together? Yeah. Oh, that's so romantic. You see, you could do that. You see, you could have a plot, and then, then when you I die, then your husband could join you later, or which vice versa. Which... <laughs> well, it's better if I go first, because I wouldn't be able to do anything... <laughs> Without him. Oh, well, no, him and his him, him and his new wife can then go oh, on the... Stop the... it! <laughs> Stephen! Oh. <laughs> Liam! Oh, God! You know that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 oh. But, you know, after your day, you know. <sighs> what, once I've withered on the vine? <laughs> no, I'm only joking. <laughs> Oh, um, anyway, let's have a look. Um, oh, gosh. Let's have a look. Oh, can uh, we talk about Tony Adams? Oh, go on, then. Oh, yes, Tony oh, Adams. I thought he was brilliant on Saturday. Um, I didn't see it, actually, because oh, I, I was uh, at a, a do. But, I mean, uh, I think it's interesting because, you know, he, he is brilliant in, in his own way. 
But he was being voted in by football fans who weren't even watching the programme, mm. which is, in a way, is wrong for the others. I mean, this is the trouble with reality TV yeah. shows. There are all sorts of problems. People have gone out much earlier than they should have done yeah. because of him. Yeah. But he was good fun, and everybody loves to have a, a laugh. Yeah, I love that when these professional athletes who've never danced before go onto the show and yeah. they just throw all their physicality into yes. I mean, he's so ungainly and tall, you can't actually believe he was a professional footballer. And you see him dancing, and he goes for it. And yeah. It's funny to watch. Oh, no, he is but, funny and to and watch. And it's enjoyable. The point of reality TV yeah. is entertainment. Yeah. I mean, you know, some of them are really, really good dancers on there. I can't tell which one's professional and which yeah, one's a celebrity. drama school. But with Tony Adams, you watched it because it was fun. And Anne Whittaker. I mean, she was hysterical yes. being pulled around. Yeah. <laughs> But Tony uh, Adams seems a nice guy, he seems nice with it. Yeah, he does, he does. Uh, so, and, and he's gone. Uh -huh. And he's gone because he uh, he had a, an injury. Yes, the producer sat on him or something, I think. <laughs> 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 Leaving that one there. Yeah. Yes. Can we have a look at Westminster Bubbles in the start? Shall we? Yes, this is the front page of the Daily Star this morning. Um, so, as I said, put on earth to cheer us up. Oh, well, and this is... Fun, but it's not fun because they have found out that uh, more than a quarter of a million pounds are being spent on cut price booze in Parliament in just one year. 30 MPs, parliamentary staff and others have downed hundreds of bottles of champagne, thousands of bottles of wine and tens of thousands of beers and ciders subsidised by the taxpayers. That's us. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, like, it's, it's nice stuff too, it's not cheap stuff. No, okay. I do. Um, I do have questions about that. Yes. Yeah. And there are there are more bars, I think, in in the Palace of Westminster than any uh, the meeting rooms or something like that. I read a, a fact really that, that they really concentrate on the hospitality aspect. Have their best lot. ideas when they've had a couple of drinks. Maybe. Yeah. Who doesn't, Isabel? Exactly. I mean, you know, that's vodka in your mug, there, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. It could be. Oh, well. uh, we're out of time. Well, she needs it working with you. Blimey, oh, I'm no. on vodka and all. They're on danger. Money begins working with me. <laughs> I know. Well, I, I understand. I get extra when working with you. Do you? Yeah. Oh, good. Not money. We're talking but about extra. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love Mondays with you guys. Yeah. It's just so We're going to get nice rid of these two before the we get cancelled, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> Begins, Jordan, thank, and thank you. you very much. See you again. Thank you. See you soon. Uh, now, it's 8.49. Let's have a quick run through some of the headlines this morning. The International Trade Secretary is travelling to Washington to try and seek a UK-US cooperation deal on global economy and trade rules. Kemi Badenoch will call for a move towards more diverse and resilient supply chains, as well as investing in new technology to support jobs. Unite has warned the Prime Minister that the autumn statement is the last chance to save the NHS. They say it's on the brink of collapse and they want the PM to act to avert industrial action and fix underfunding. A report has found that young people will struggle the most to pay their bills this winter. The Resolution Foundation's intergenerational audit found younger generations are four times more likely to be on prepayment meters and less likely to have assets or savings. Now, for many, running is a great way to look after mental and physical health. Mental health particularly, actually. Yeah. I've got to say, it's meant to be quite good for clearing the mind. It's meant to be. So they tell me. I've never done it. I don't, I'm not a fan of running. Uh, but our next guest is undertaking a gruelling challenge to raise money for Movember, which highlights health challenges that men go through. Anil Tarati uh, has set himself the goal of running every day in November, increasing the amount that he runs every single day. Yes, starting with one kilometre on the first day of the month, ending with 30 kilometres on the last day, which means a total of 465 kilometres. And he's here now, he's taking a break to come and join us. Morning to you. Good morning. So what, what does this, well, you're 14 kilometres today. Yep, done and dusted this morning. I started at 6am, yeah, had to get it done before I got into the studio. So, yeah, feeling good so far. And how wow. long does that take you? Um, probably, it took me about an hour and 25 minutes this morning. I'm just trying to go at an easy pace so that I can make sure that I you know, get through to the end of the month, really. Oh, right, well, that's not bad going, then, is it? It's, uh, it's not terrible, but I'm, I can start feeling that, you know, some of the physical aspects are starting to keep uh, creep in, you know, got a slightly funny knee at the moment so yeah 
I think what, it's going to be quite tough. How did you come up and why did you come up with this challenge? Um, so I think, you know, as you mentioned, it's uh, increments of one kilometre every day. And I think it's my representation, basically, of uh, if you don't deal with your mental health challenges, you know, you're going to get to a breaking point, And that's really what I'm trying to represent is, mm. you know, if I said to you, could you run one kilometre with me on the first day? You might be like, yeah, OK, yeah. why not? But, you know, at some point, it, it will definitely start creeping in. Yeah. And look, we know mental health, um, particularly when it comes to men, is a difficult one because men are infamously bad at, at, at talking about it. You know, that yeah. there's this high proportion of, of suicides amongst uh, amongst men in particular. Yeah. So this is incredibly important. How has it helped your mental health specifically? Yeah, I think me personally, you know, it's been amazing to kind of speak about it a little bit more openly. I've gone through mental health challenges uh, in my teens and also in my 20s. I was, um, had a fair bit of depression and suicidal thoughts as well. So I was able to kind of get through that. I think talking about it for me, is almost a little bit cathartic. I'm able to connect with people and then um, it's also nice to hear that other people are, you know, have experienced it and are opening up when I do. And I think that's really important. Well, that's the thing. And I was saying this to <laughs> a guest we had on yesterday, Paul Minter. Um, th this is the problem. And again, I mean, it might be the same for women, I don't know, but certainly for men, anyone who's having some mental health problems think they are the only person in the world. Definitely. I think, you know, sometimes you think you're so unique in the world, but, you know, a lot of people have gone through something like this, uh, either, you know, worse or maybe to a lesser degree than you. So I think it is really important to kind of create the conversation and then understand that you're not alone in this, really, and there's nothing wrong with you. And, mm. and how has exercise and specifically running helped your mental health? I mean, did you see an instant improvement? Because um, we've been talking in the past about doctors yeah. prescribing exercise because yeah. you can get this quick hit. Yeah, definitely. I think there's a level of kind of, you know, endorphins that I get and really, you know, look, I'm not a Monday morning, let's get out there and chase it sort of person usually, but the fact that I got a run in definitely makes me feel good. I think I have a lot of anxiety at the moment this year in particular, um, which has kind of manifested into physical anxiety. I have a lot of trouble breathing, but once I do start running, that first 10 minutes helps me calm down, feels like I'm in control, gives me the confidence to know that you know, I can overcome my anxiety, and I think that's really important as well. Were you a runner before all of this? Um, yeah, I was a pretty bad runner for a, a fair bit of time, and then I think, uh, you know, for the last few years, I've just picked it up a little bit more. And it's great, you know, anyone can do it. You don't need gear, you don't need yeah. to, um, you know, go anywhere or anything, you just get outside and run. What's the point at which you became a good runner? Because that's the bit <laughs> that most people give up before they reach that Tomorrow. stage. To, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, to be fair, I, you know, I still don't consider myself a great runner. I think I just do it because I enjoy it. It gives me When the did space. you start enjoying it, though? <laughs> a lot of people never yeah. enjoy it, you know? Uh, look, I think the, the first time I ran a 5K without stopping, I was like, great, this is an excellent feeling. And then I think I just set progressive goals. So now mm. I've done a couple of half marathons this year. I'm going to try and do um, a marathon next year if possible, you know, I think just having incremental goals is a great thing as well. Yeah, absolutely. Look, um, you must have what a just giving or something, have you? Yes. So go on, get it out there. If you're on my, uh, if you go onto my website, which is anilt.com, uh, there's a link to my Movember page. Um, I think I'm just around two thousand pounds at the moment. I'm trying to get to three, so I'd love any donations. Um, and then also, if you're willing to run, if you're around East London or Paddington, um, there's a sign up sheet on my website. I'm happy to have people join me and have a bit of a chat. That would be amazing as well. Oh wow, Brilliant. fantastic! Okay, really good nice to see idea. you this morning. Nice to have a bit of Antipodean accent in here as well. Yeah. Australia, is Australia, not New Zealand. It is an Australian accent. I've been here for eight years, but I clearly can't shake it. It's no, uh, why would quite you thick. Want to? You know, I want, you want to? I want to soften it a little bit, but no, 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 no. It's nice. It's nice. Well, I don't, I don't want to toss up how many k you've got left, but a fair few to get to four, three, five kilometres by the end of the month. But good luck. Really Thank you very much. Luck. Thank really you. Really good to see you. Uh, now, coming up, we're going to be talking to the Foreign Secretary, James Cleverly, about this new deal between the UK and France to try to stop migrants illegally crossing the Channel. First, though, here's your weather. Looking ahead to today's weather and the UK is looking foggy in the east, gradually clearing with some rain pushing into the west. Let's take a look at the details. So starting off in the southwest of England, and here it's looking pretty wet this lunchtime. Rain will continue to edge eastwards but things will turn brighter through the afternoon. Meanwhile in the southeast the morning fog should have mostly cleared and some brightness may be breaking out for many but it will be largely cloudy. Rain will have edged into western parts of Wales and it will be mostly light and should take a little longer to reach most eastern parts. But meanwhile across the Midlands it should be dry this lunchtime with the rain not set to arrive here until later on and it will be mostly cloudy though perhaps misty for some.
It's also looking dry but cloudy around northeastern England. Here it will stay dry through much of the afternoon, though the cloud may be thick enough for a few spots of rain. There may be the odd spot of rain around eastern parts of Scotland. Meanwhile, further west, it's looking wetter, although the rain will not be especially heavy. The earlier rain will have cleared from Northern Ireland, so it'll be mostly dry here and the clouds should break up, meaning some sunny breaks are expected this afternoon. So the rain in the west will edge a little further eastwards this afternoon and it will be drier and brighter following on from that. And that's how the weather is shaping up for the rest of your Monday. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. There's never been a more interesting but also critical time in British politics. And I can't wait to bring you the biggest stories of the day with the best factual accuracy and also a few of my own opinions thrown in. We'll engage in passionate but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Monday to Thursday, 10 till 12 on TV, on radio and online. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deeds and Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. The Home Secretary has signed a new agreement with France to tackle illegal crossings. 
Good morning, it's 9.01. It's Monday, the 14th of November, and you're listening to or watching Breakfast on GB News with Isabel and Stephen. Here's what's leading the news for you this morning. The Home Secretary has signed a new pact with France to stem the flow of migrants crossing the Channel. It comes as a number of people making the journey this year surpassed 40,000 already. The Chancellor has warned that everyone will have to pay more tax under his new economic plans due to be published on Thursday. Jeremy Hunt is reportedly looking to raise 20 billion in taxes. He feels betrayed by the club. Ronaldo speaks out about his experience at Man United as he says the manager, Eric Ten Hag, is trying to force him out. And King Charles turns 74 today. The occasion is going to be marked by a rendition of Happy Birthday by the Household Cavalry and gun salutes across the capital. Love to hear from you. Get in touch via email, like Clive, who says if you can afford buy now, pay later, you can afford to save in advance. Uh, well, it's a fair point, Clive. GBviews at gbnews.uk. So our top story this morning, the Home Secretary has finalised a new agreement on tackling illegal crossings. Now that includes a 40% increase in the number of French officers patrolling beaches in northern France, as well as investment in port security to prevent illegal entry. Well, UK officers will work together with their French counterparts for the first time, sharing information to understand the threat. And there'll also be a focus on technology and more investment in removal centres. Well, the Home Secretary has been talking this morning and had this to say. There are several elements to the deal and I think it represents a positive next step to our collaboration with the French. It's not going to fix it overnight, it's not a silver bullet, but I think for the first time we have some real wins for both the French and the UK. First of all, we'll see embedded observers. That means there will be British officers working on French soil, observing the work or working on the ground with French officers to uh, detect and intercept the illegal migrants as they attempt to leave France. Uh, we'll be working hand in hand in the control rooms, uh, you know, managing intelligence and working to, uh, with law enforcement bodies. There'll be a 40% uplift in the number of French gendarmes patrolling the French beaches, and there'll be stronger and closer collaboration when it comes to criminal law enforcement, intelligence collaboration and uh, interception upstream so that the organised immigration criminal gangs can further be disrupted and dismantled. Well, in the last few moments, uh, we're hearing reports a small migrant boat has landed on a Kent beach this morning where 10 people were on board and have disappeared off. This is in addition to the 972 who arrived over the weekend. Yeah, well, the dinghy landed on St Margaret's Beach between Dover and Deal at about 8 o'clock. Uh, let's talk to our Home and Security Editor, Mark White, who's across all of this. Morning to you, Mark. Um, look, the, the fact we've had another boat this, mo uh, this morning, another 10 people disappearing somewhere into the country, just highlights how urgent, actually, this issue is. Yeah, so we've had several boats that have come across so far today. Uh, this is the only one that's made it to the beach. But we're seeing a shift in tactics from those crossing the channel because increasingly, of course, we know that many Albanians are coming across. Uh, and to be quite honest, the vast majority of them do not want to get into the asylum system. They want, according to official sources that we've been speaking to, uh, to get here to work in the illegal economy and many of them actually to work for criminal gangs. So the last thing they want is to be detained down in Manston to enter the asylum system. Uh, so if they can land on a beach uh, and then run off and be picked up by counterparts here in this country, uh, that's exactly what they'll do. And we've been seeing that happening increasingly. Uh, on the French side of the channel as well, uh, we've been seeing uh, the French authorities, perhaps in preparation for this uh, signing of this document between the Home Secretary and our counterpart in Paris this morning, 
Uh, we've been seeing French police out in numbers there trying to frustrate those trying to get into the small boat. Uh, our uh, GB News team was on the ground uh, at Gravelines near Dunkirk over the weekend where we saw clashes between the French police and migrants in that area. They were throwing stones and sticks towards the police as the police prevented them from getting down uh, towards the, the beach at Gravelines uh, to launch the vessels. And our producer in Gravelines saw at least two boats that had been slashed, punctured, deflated uh, by the French authorities. And that is, I think, what we are to expect, according to Ciela Braverman, from this deal, this 72 million euro deal uh, with the French, uh, more, a 40 percent increase in the number of police officers on those beaches. But it is a big, long stretch of beach. Uh, and of course, they can stop migrants crossing one day. Uh, but as we know uh, from the way the pattern that this has evolved in recent years, they'll just come back the next day and try again. Mark White, we'll leave it there because the Foreign Secretary is standing by. Thanks very much indeed for that. Uh, uh, with great pleasure, I can now introduce uh, James Cleverly to the programme this morning. Very good morning to you. Um, look, we've already sent uh, a huge amount of money over to the French over the years to tackle this issue, 174.8 million. What difference will this 63 million make to the challenge? Well, we have seen that the money that we have given to the French authorities to support their actions on the French coast and the close working relationship between the French and the UK authorities has prevented this year 29,000 people who attempted to cross the channel. It's helped uh, bring about 500 arrests of people traffickers. It's helped break over 50 criminal gangs. So the money is making a difference. But what we have got to recognise, as your report indicated, the people smugglers are uh, changing their tactics. We need to evolve our tactics as well. Um, having uh, British border officials in the French control rooms gives us greater coordination and greater effectiveness. And together, we will crack down on these uh, illegal criminal gangs because it's in both the French interests and the British interests to do so. What gets confusing in all this, we were talking to someone from Migrant Watch earlier on, um, and they were saying that, and I, I can't remember the exact figure, but, you know, more than half of, of people who, are, who come over this way and then are processed, which takes a long time, more than half get, getting asylum claims anyway. Now, she was arguing, don't we need to have easier legal routes for people who actually do have a genuine claim? Well, we do have legal routes, and if someone wants to come and make their life here in the UK, and I can completely understand, uh, I can completely understand why people want to do so. This is a fantastic country. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a country that many people uh, would aspire to come to. That is completely understandable. But there are safe and legal routes to do so. That's the routes that people should uh, should take. Um, but what we have, uh, what we are seeing, is people who are using illegal routes, illicit routes, using people smugglers to, to try and come here. And that is never going to be an acceptable or an appropriate route to become um, a, a member of our society. And so we, it's absolutely right through the work that we're doing with our French counterparts, but also the work that we're doing with other countries around the world, the countries from which these people come, as well as the domestic legislation that we brought through with the Immigration and Borders Bill, that we address all the points in the chain uh, that bring people to our coastline. The whole argument, wasn't it, with the Rwanda deal was to act as a deterrent, but instead of that being a, being a success, all of these people who are amassing on the French border trying to get into the UK have got uh, the attraction of knowing that they'll be put up at vast expense by the UK government if they make it to the UK. We're a soft touch, aren't we, at a time where people are asking, can we even afford to eat or heat this winter? If you come into the country illegally, you'll, you'll be staying in a £200 a night hotel. Well, the uh, Immigration and Borders Bill that we took through the House recently, and I, I would remind your viewers, it was a bill that was opposed by the opposition uh, parties 
that is about making sure that our processing of uh, asylum and immigration applications is much faster, much uh, more effective, that the people who seek to abuse our system are not able to uh, do so. Um, because we need to make it quite clear to people who are paying uh, sometimes tens of thousands of pounds to people smugglers that that money will be wasted because they will be returned to the country that they've come from. So we are taking the domestic action and when that, um, that, that, that piece of legislation fully comes into force that will, that will play a part as will the arrangements that we're making with France, as will the work that I and the other ministers in the uh, uh, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office do to make sure that we bring stability to the countries from which these people come. It's all part of it, and the government is focused on addressing this issue, and we're focused on addressing all parts of this chain. There's a problem, isn't there? The, the, the minute you try to send people back, the lawyers get involved. Um, can we do anything whilst we're still part of the European Court of Human Rights? Well, I, I cannot believe, I cannot genuinely believe that human rights lawyers feel that it is, it is what the legislation envisaged, these human rights legislation envisaged, uh, creating a situation which benefits people traffickers. Um, that cannot be that cannot be really what the drafters of international human rights legislation envisage. We need to break the business model of some of the most evil and pernicious people in the world, people who trade in human misery. And the right and fair thing to do is for uh, these applications to be dealt with quickly, professionally, fairly, so that people have certainty. And if you are allowed to stay here in the UK, you know that quickly. And if you're not allowed, you find out quickly and, are you, and you are returned home. That's how this system should work. And our Immigration and Borders Bill is designed to make the system work in that way. I'll tell you what, Foreign Secretary, you've got to crack on with this, haven't you, uh, post-haste, because come Thursday, uh, you're going to be asking, according to the Chancellor, you're going to be asking everybody in this country, near as damn it, to pay more money in tax and possibly see reductions in public services to bring us economic stability. Well, if we're doing our part, government's got to do its part, hasn't it, with issues like this? Well, we are absolutely focused on this. And the fact that the economic situation is tough, you're right, means that uh, this, will, this will be... Uh, a a focus, quite rightly a focus, of the uh, British people. They will want to see us taking action on this, and we are taking action on this. When it comes to Thursday's uh, statement, uh, the, the Prime Minister and the Chancellor have made it absolutely clear that we will continue to support those people who are struggling. Just today we've had the, uh, the latest of the payments for our energy support package come through. We will always support the people who are struggling, but we also have to make sure that we balance the books. And the decisions that the Prime Minister and Chancellor have already taken uh, has increased confidence in the markets, it has reduced the cost uh, of uh, borrowing from the high point that we saw earlier on uh, in the autumn. These things are positive steps, but we do still have tough decisions to make and, and real hard work to do. Yeah, uh, tough decisions, hard work uh, to do, but also incredibly challenging if you are going to try and find £35 billion in spending cuts for our institutions. I mean, we've, we've already lived through austerity, but arguably the mood music this time as we head into austerity mark two is a lot worse. We're heading possibly into recession. There is a risk, is there not, that with such measures as this, as raising taxes and, and huge spending cuts, we could actually risk making the situation worse, overreacting. Well, the, the world is seeing economic pressures. I think the predictions are that a third, one, one in three of global economies could tip into a recession next year. It is going to be tough for everybody. But here in the UK, even though things are difficult, they are in a better place than a number of our international competitors. Our interest rates are lower than many of the uh, um, uh, countries that I visit uh, around the world. 
our uh, inflation, whilst higher than we would want, is still significantly lower than many other parts of the world. And even things like reducing our greenhouse emissions, we've got the uh, fastest reduction in greenhouse emissions of the uh, G7. We are well ahead of many of the countries in the G20. So things are tough. We absolutely recognise they are tough. And as I say, we will support those families who need our help and support through these difficult times. Um, and the challenges, are he the challenges ahead are ones that we will need to get a grip of. But we are in a better situation than many other countries around the world. And the decisions that the PM and the Chancellor are taking is about making sure we weather these, these difficult times ahead. We talked to analysts. One of the things they say needs to be done, I wonder if you can shed any light as to whether we'll get it on Thursday, is that people need to see the light at the end of the tunnel. We need to hear more about the longer, mid to longer term strategy that, that Number 11 is employing here so we can at least see how we can get out of this. Will we get that? Well, look, you, you will understand that I'm not in a position where I can pre-announce the Chancellor's speech, but we recognise that hope and aspiration are important motivators. Uh, they help stimulate economic activity. They are, they are, they are, they are good for business. Um, and we also recognise, of course, that we do need to balance the books and we need to make sure that the uh, financial decisions that we make are economically uh, sustainable. Um, but, as I say, I'm not in a position where I can pre-announce uh, the the, the measures in the Chancellor's speech from Thursday. No. Oh, we can but try, James <laughs> Cleverly. We can but try. Uh, it's really good to talk to you. Thank you for coming on GB News, and I hope we can welcome you back sometime soon. Thank you. <laughs> uh, stay with us. We're going to take a break. After that, we're going to be speaking to the Shadow Immigration Minister, Stephen Kinnock. See you in a sec. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. There's never been a more interesting but also critical time in British politics. And I can't wait to bring you the biggest stories of the day with the best factual accuracy and also a few of my own opinions thrown in. We'll engage in passionate but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Monday to Thursday, 10 till 12 on TV, on radio and online. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deems & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News.
On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Home Secretary has finalised a new agreement on tacking illegal crossings, as we've been discussing this morning. Yes, so there should be a 40% increase in the number of French officers patrolling beaches in northern France, as well as investment in port security to prevent illegal entry. Well, before the break, we heard from the Foreign Secretary, James Cleverly, but what about the opposition? Well, we're joined now by the Shadow Minister for Immigration, Stephen Kinnock. A very good morning to you, Mr Kinnock. Um, good, good news, morning. this? A good use of public money? Well, it's too little too late. Uh, the Conservatives have had 12 years to get a grip on our asylum system. The Home Secretary herself has said the asylum system is broken, and we agree with her, and the Conservatives have broken it. We've got 37,000 asylum seekers in the hotels, costing the taxpayer £6 million pounds a day. Uh, we've um, got under-resourcing of the National Crime Agency. We've had a breakdown in the relationship with France. And, of course, it's good to see that there's some more constructive conversations uh, going on now. But this is the sort of thing that should have been happening years ago. And, of course, it's a big pull factor. The fact that the processing system is broken means that if someone wants to pay a people smuggler $10,000 to get on one of those small boats, they know that when they get to the UK, they will be um, left in the system for years, uh, waiting for their case to be reviewed. So it's a, a safe bet, if you like. So get the asylum processing system fixed and you remove a lot of the pull factor. Combine that with it resourcing the National Crime Agency. We would do that by scrapping the unaffordable, unworkable and unethical Rwanda plan. Uh, and using that money to really fund an elite unit inside the National Crime Agency. So let's get the mechanics of government working, do the hard yards rather than chasing headlines and all the kind of gimmicks uh, that this government has been trying for far too long. Hold, hold on a minute, though, hold on a minute. Well, whilst, uh, and no, I don't think anyone would argue with your fundamental point that actually the system here needs to be sorted out and sorted out vigorously and quickly. The government says it is going to be looking at that, right? so we'll have to wait and see. However, this isn't, this isn't a headline-grabbing move, is it, by the Home Secretary? This is something which will actually start to ease the burden um, on those uh, asylum centres, on the hotels, on the processing centres. It's going to start to ease that burden pretty quickly. Well, the jury's out. We'll, we really do hope that we'll see an increase in the number of interceptions. Um, I'm not convinced enough is being done upstream to break the model of the business smugglers through using intelligence, resourcing the National Crime Agency properly. But really, one of the big gimmicks we've seen that simply isn't working is this Rwanda scheme, which was told we were told the mere threat of being sent to Rwanda. I know that the uh, issue is currently held up in the courts, but the mere threat, we were told, of being sent to Rwanda would discourage people from trying to cross the channel. And yet we've seen since uh, the Nationality and Borders Act came became law, since the Rwanda plan was announced, we've seen the numbers of people trying to cross the channel on small boats going through the roof. So scrap that, stop all the gimmicks, uh, stop all the headline chasing around that and do the hard yards, the mechanics of getting the asylum processing system sorted uh, and resourcing the NCA properly uh, and having a proper uh, deal with France, which also includes, of course, a returns agreement because Boris Johnson completely failed to negotiate a successor to the Dublin Convention, which would have enabled us to send uh, ref those who fail their asylum claims back to the first country, safe country in which they landed. And, and that's been a major pull factor as well, the fact that we haven't had a successor to the Dublin Convention. Oh, well, so of course, the, the Dublin Agreement the, the was hardly ever government. successfully used when we were still part of the European Union, which has been part of a, a huge reason why the British public have been so dissatisfied for years. And there is such a strong mandate from the British people to try and get a grip of this problem. 
Well, absolutely. I mean, I, I think anything that's costing the British taxpayer £6 million a day in hotel bills is, is clearly something that's broken, needs to get fixed, and people's concerns of this, around this are absolutely understandable. I mean, it's the first duty of government to be able to secure our borders. Um, but the, 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 I just feel that a huge amount of time uh, and energy and resources have been wasted uh, on um, harebrained schemes that just haven't been working at all. So let's get back down to the nitty-gritty of government. Let's get that constructive uh, relationship with France and let's move forward. Frankly, the only way we're going to get that was, is with the Labour government, because we've had now this revolving door of chaos in the Conservative Party. We've lost count of the number of Home Secretaries and Prime Ministers we've had. So little wonder that it's been impossible to get a clear strategy and plan in place when you have that level of chaos at the, at the, head, at the top of government. OK, Stephen Kinnock, really good to talk to you this morning. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, a little bit of breaking news. We're just hearing reports in the last few moments that Sergei Lavrov, who, of course, is the Russian foreign minister, who's attending Bali for the G20 in the Philippines, has been taken to hospital. We don't have any more details about that at the moment. Of course, it's one of the big tensions of the G20 uh, is that the West was going to be, have to be confronting Russia over the next few days. But uh, that an update that Sergei Lavrov has been taken to hospital. We'll find out all the details for you. And I suppose Tom Harwood will have updates for he you. Will, he uh, will. Because we're done for this morning. Uh, that's it from me. I'll be back tomorrow from 6. Uh, and I'll be back in a couple of weeks. Fingers <laughs> crossed. See you soon. Have a lovely day. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. Every Friday and Sunday night from 9, it's Mark Dolan tonight. We're on the same page again. Great, There's something great great happening. Let him finish. Don't it be such a cranky. <laughs> that mini budget was the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> and on Saturday, my show just got bigger. From 8, it's Mark Dolan's Saturday Night In. You can't govern a country if you can't speak. <laughs> Stop talking. My God, we reached the end. I've never been early in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Only on GB News, the People's Channel. Join me, Arlene Foster, for the briefing on GB News. Every Friday at 3 p.m., I'll give you all the latest political news and analysis, and we'll have a robust live debate. To make sure that you're caught up on all of the biggest issues of the day, we'll bring on experts in their field. I'll ask the questions that you'd like to ask. We're not afraid to tackle discussions from all perspectives, including yours. Don't forget, the briefing with me, Arlene Foster, every Friday at 3 p.m. on GB News.